have more places for people to live. So she's within your league because there's going to be ideally mutual attraction. You're attracting each other. If anybody is triggered in this room, it is not me. Okay. That's good. So it's fine. I think you can just explain it. Hold on. I've explained it. it three times. I'll explain it again. No, you. No, you. You. No, you. You. Tell us something great. barriers to people understanding the other side. Sometimes it's just a little bit of information or a little bit. Of Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode one of Bridges podcast. I'm sure you're all so excited or not excited for this event. We're happy to have you. We are coming live to you with our first guest in Miami, Jeremiah Johnson. Hi. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Kyla. This is Steven. Hi, what's up? And uh, we're excited to talk to you about internet and politics and all sorts of sexy things and why uh, the Democrats need to, you know, figure their shit out. So without further ado, enjoy the conversation. So, okay. First thing, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. What do you do? Tell us about new liberalism, all that sort of stuff so that we know who you are and what's going on. Sure. Absolutely. So. Uh, my name is Jeremiah Johnson. I do a lot of things. I host a podcast. I have a Substack. I write and I talk. Um, but I'm probably best known online for founding the Center for New Liberalism, which has gone by a couple names um, in its lifetime. It has also been known as the Neoliberal Project um, back when in the edgier era of the internet when you could get a lot of people mad just by saying the word neoliberal online very loudly. Um, but basically what the Neoliberal Project or the Center for New Liberalism, as we call it now, is is a center-left organizing group. It uh, has chapters around 60 or 70 cities in the U.S. and maybe 10 to 12 countries internationally. Um, I'm trying to think almost every continent. I think, I think we have one in South Africa now. Um, we have Taiwan. We have plenty in Europe. I think we have a very active Brazil chapter. So these local chapters do organizing. Um, they, you know, do things in their city, show up to city council meetings, uh, advocate for the policies that we believe in, uh, the values that we have. Um, they, you know, work and, and help try to elect different congressional candidates and city council candidates and mayors where they're from. And so that's what the Center for New Liberalism broadly is doing, is advocating for kind of a center left viewpoint. And I'm happy to get into exactly what that means because that's a very broad, generalized label. Um, but that was a group that I founded just a few years ago. Um, that's uh, the short version of it, but happy to get into more detail. What do you, um, from like an organizational point of view, are you trying to back candidates or something eventually? Or are, are you guys just trying to like advocate for policies on a, on a city level? Or what does that look like? Yeah, so it's funny. We started out as a 501c3. Um, and our structure was that we were part of a 501c3. And so if when you're doing that... Could you tell us what that is? Yeah, a 501c3 is a particular kind of nonprofit, right? And so when you are a 501c3, you cannot endorse candidates. The, the benefit is that uh, you're, it, when people contribute to you, it's tax deductible. That's essentially the big benefit. Um, but you because it's supposed to be educational and tax deductible, you can't back specific legislation and you can't back candidates. Last year, CNL transitioned to being a 501c4, which means that uh, we can now back candidates. And so we are actually uh, endorsing candidates, endorsing legislation as, as we see it. Some of our local chapters get involved in their like city council races, and we'll put out a slate of this is who we're endorsing for different seats in city council. Um, so we're very much part of that now. Yeah. What's like the, <clears throat> I guess, ultimately... What is the goal for the organization? Like, if you had like a grand plan, like, is your goal to be able to pick like presidential candidates, like the Libertarian Party tries to do? Is your goal to just have like a strong local presence in cities that you feel strongly about changing? And we were talking about a little bit about like zoning beforehand. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Or, or yeah, what is like the grand design? I guess. I mean, so if I'm being very unmodest, the the grand design is to change the face of American politics. And as uh, is all know, okay. online, <laughs> right. political. Change, change, cash, change cash. the an entire trajectory of American history. And that's a really big, hard thing to do. So you've got to bite it, you know, uh, a little bit at a time. Like, how do you eat a whale? You know, one bite at a time. Um, so we are basically trying to accomplish that goal by, at this point, changing the Democratic Party. 
that's the kind of the space that we live in is essentially you know moderate democrats tend to be our our biggest fans the people who align with us very often um and again moderate is one of those tricky words that i'm i'm happy to kind of get into exactly what moderate means because i don't really like calling myself a moderate but we are trying to keep the democratic party focused on what we think is good policy what we think is really helpful policy and the kind of stances that can both help America be a stronger, more prosperous country, more equal, more free, et cetera, et cetera, all those beautiful things, and also help them win elections. Because I think Democrats have, uh, as much as I'm on the team and I am desperately trying to elect Democrats, I think that they have some very clear issues in terms of messaging and in terms of chasing policy dead ends that are not particularly helpful. So I think right now that's the um, the focus is on building a better, stronger, more robust Democratic Party. So when you say <laughs> change the entire trajectory of uh, politics right now, uh, could you like narrow that into three specific things or four specific things? Like what are the specific things you want to change? Sure. Well, and, and to give kind of an example of what that looks like, you know, the libertarians in the 1970s, for instance, would have been a very, very fringe movement who didn't have a lot of sway. 1970s were definitely an era of big government, lots of new regulations coming in, um, lots of new big programs. But in the long term, you know, they kind of sat around and said, well, we've got to infiltrate institutions. We've got to get into positions of power. We've got to influence people in positions of power. And through the 80s and the 90s, they had a lot of influence. There's never been a libertarian who's won the presidential race. I don't even think there's even been a libertarian who's won a... Uh, a congressional race who actually ran libertarian party. There have been yeah. some Republicans who call themselves libertarians. The Pauls, and but that. but at the same time, libertarianism as a ideology very clearly had a big impact on the trajectory of American politics. You can say something similar about like the DSA. You know, in in the eighties or the nineties, they would have been a joke of an organization. Uh, socialist was still kind of a political slur word in America at that point, but they kept doing their work. They kept, you know doing all this stuff. And over time, they built up enough organizing power that they've definitely impacted the trajectory of American politics. Our goal is to kind of do something similar. And we think we can do that. Um, to talk about the specific issues like, well, okay, you've defined yourself, but what do you actually care about? There's a few things that we care about. We tend to be, the, I, I like to say, the capitalist wing of the Democratic Party. Um, we think markets are great. Markets lead to a lot of prosperity. It doesn't mean markets are perfect and that they can never fail. But markets fundamentally are, are pretty good at, in, in a lot of ways. How do you feel like the Democrats are maybe not addressing that then right now? Like, what do you think they're failing on capitalism? Um, it, it's interesting because capitalism is such a big word. I prefer to break it down into, you know, more specific issues like housing. Uh, I talk about housing all the time and I, I get really mad about housing all the time. And one of the things that makes me mad is that we can't just get out of our own way and build more housing. A lot of this is a democratic issue because virtually every city in America of any meaningful size is controlled by Democrats. Every big city in America, to some first approximation, uh, the mayor is a Democrat and the city council is controlled by Democrats and, and so forth. And in all of our biggest cities and, and in our most prosperous cities, you know, and the cities where there's all this innovation happening, San Francisco, Seattle, Los Angeles, New York. We can't build enough housing and we have acute housing crises. And it's because of, you know, overregulation. It's because of zoning laws. It's because of all these arcane little things, you know, floor area ratios and setbacks and environmental reviews and community input sessions that you're mandated to have 10 of them over the course of two years before you can build anything. And you kind of, it, there's this bureaucratic kludge that is very much supported by local Democrats on, on city councils and in, you know, state legislatures that stops you from just doing the very simple thing of building more housing. And we know that that works. We know that if you build more housing, rents go down. There's just an enormous pile of evidence for that. How do you incentivize people to, to want to do that? Because when you say, so for instance, when you say like rents go down, this is always like one of the reasons why I feel like housing is such an intractable issue is if you bring rents down, it's good for people that are moving into the city and it can be good for people, some people in the city, but I feel like your strongest voter base always stands to lose the most. Like when you say rents go down, people that own buildings there don't want rents to go down. Yeah, this, or when this you say it brings uh, down property values, it makes it more affordable. Well, homeowners, your strongest voter base, like 
don't want homes to be more affordable. They want the, the prices to go up. This is the home voter theory, yeah. Okay. And, and there's some legitimacy to this, I think. I think it's one reason that there is resistance to building more housing, right? But I don't think it's the only reason, and I'm not sure that it's the dominant reason. I think a lot of it is genuine kind of fear of change, that people just kind of like their neighborhoods the way they are. And if, you, you know, if you're not actively paying you know, $3,500 a, a month for rent for so like a one bedroom apartment, then you don't feel like anything needs to change. And, you know, you don't like that there's a lot of construction and noise and new people in the neighborhood. And I think that kind of just generic resistance to change is a lot of what uh, drives this. And, you know, th there's other things as well. There's people who are concerned about the environment, which I think is, you know, I don't think that makes a lot of sense, but I think that there are people who feel that way. Um, so I, I think you hammer this from a couple ways in, in terms of one of the things I've found most effective is that you, you play on the generation gap because there's a lot of uh, people who are older, who are Gen X or who are boomers who own their own homes and they're doing quite well, but they've actually started to notice at this point that their kids can't afford to live near them because their kids can't buy a house because of the housing crisis that we have. And I've, I've had pretty good success appealing to that. Like, don't you want your kid to be able to buy a house? Yes, you're doing very well. What about your son? You know, who's, he's got a good job. He's out of college. He's done everything right. And he still can't afford a house. Sometimes that works. You know, there's, there's all these kind of little tactical tricks that I have when talking to people. But, you mm -hmm. know, th that's one that I find is, is often pretty good. Is there any city right now in the U.S.? I, um, oh, I think somebody sent me an email on Minneapolis, there was one city mm -hmm. that they was was that the one. There was one that like just basically cleared for a bunch of new housing units to be constructed, and as expected, like the prices came down. It typically benefited anybody or yeah. everybody. Are there other major cities that are making any progress on this, or is this like a dead issue in yeah every major metropolis? Yeah. So Minneapolis has done a lot of really good stuff. Minneapolis um, abolished single family zoning, and importantly, just to for people who react to that, it doesn't mean they abolished single family housing but they abolished single family zoning that says you can in, in this wide area of the city. And it's in most cities, it's a lot of it. Like Seattle, for instance, a big city, something like 80 to 90% of Seattle is zoned so that only single family homes can be built there. Yeah. There's the classic neoliberal subreddit picture of San Francisco where it's like, people think San Francisco is this and it's downtown and it's yeah. actually this, and it's like miles yeah. and miles and miles of sprawling fucking housing. And, and we're not even talking yeah. about the suburbs. We're talking about no, just yeah, the yeah. city limits. Yeah. Do you know, people want to change this though? Like, I feel like yeah. I could see so much resistance. Like I, I think single family homes are kind of arcane but it feels like that's what most people want though like i feel like if you zoned for something different and i think that's fine people would be upset i think what you should do is you should allow property owners the option of you can build a single family home on this plot of land or you can build a duplex or you can build a fourplex you know and we're not even getting into anything radical we're not even getting into the more libertarian case of well you should be able to build a tower on your house but just that kind of gentle density is what um I think Minneapolis legalized in terms of like up to four plexes are legal now to build everywhere. You don't have to. You could still build single family home if you want to. They also did a lot of stuff. Um, they funded um, like subsidized affordable housing. They legalized and made it much easier to build ADUs, which are uh, like uh, additional dwelling units. It's think about like a grandma flat or a little add on to your house in the back or whatever and california or was it just la or san francisco approved these and people were california some people were happy has. some people were losing their minds yeah yeah california has in a and like something like a third of california's new housing last year was adus mm -hmm. like it's crazy but uh minneapolis is one of the few democratic cities in a democratic state democratic stronghold that is really doing very well on this the other places that are doing very well and politically this makes me sad even though i, I want everywhere to build more housing uh, is typically red states. Florida is building a ton of housing. Texas's big cities are all building a ton of housing. Austin, Texas is unrecognizable from what it was, you know, 20 years ago, uh, uh, 10 years ago even. And this is just by stripping zoning, basically? I mean, it's it's just by, they. It, it's complicated because every city has their own layers of stuff. Like you can get into so much detail here. You can talk about floor area ratios and what kind of environmental reviews you have, what kind of labor standards you're held to, what kind of parking requirements you have, what kind of cover, like there's all this like alphabet soup of stuff that you have to do to build anything in America. Right. And so different cities will be more and less strict on different things. But just in general, all major cities in Texas in general make it very easy to build. They have less of that stuff. Whereas, 
you know, in, in San Francisco and New York and a lot of the, the deepest blue areas of the country, it's, um, it's nearly impossible to build. There's, there's one development near me in New York. It's called the Lirio and it's, uh, uh, like affordable housing being built and it still hasn't broken ground yet. It's we're recording this in what, uh, March, 2024. This was first proposed as part of the Bloomberg administration's plan in like 2008 to build more housing. And it took them five years from that just to agree with a site the housing was going to be built on. And it's taken them 10 years to get community input sign off and environmental reviews. And, and the local Democratic club was really angry that, that they had low income carve outs, but not low and medium income carve outs. And these, these are all actual fights that were being had. And the, the net result is that it's, you know, it's like 15 years later and a shovel has still not hit the ground. What so, do you think, what did yeah. Minneapolis do right to, I guess, lubricate, to ease the, I, I guess, burden or to get rid of all the friction yeah. between building stuff? Why Minneapolis? Why were they the only ones? What do they do differently? One of the phrases that I think is helpful here is the phrase, uh, by right. And it means that if you want to build something, you can build it without having to go through a lot of process. In San Francisco, for instance, virtually everything is discretionary. If you want to build a development of some kind, you know, it has to go before the, the board of supervisors is what they call their city council in San Francisco, and they have to approve it. And nothing, there, there's no process for just, well, I have this land, I want to build this thing, I can just do it. No, everything is discretionary. Everything has to be bargained over, and they'll find things they don't like, the board of supervisors, and they'll ask you to do more stuff. and blah, 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 blah. Whereas by right, you fill out a form, you say, this is my land. It is zoned this way. I am building something that fits within that zone. Here's the form. Thank you. I'm about to build it. And that's a little bit of a simplification, but Minneapolis made, uh, I think like up to fourplex housing um, by right. And so single family zoning doesn't exist. If you want to build something more, if you want to build an ADU, they got rid of a lot of that, um, that kludge. And so to, to kind of back us back out of housing. A lot of, I think, what we advocate for is this kind of approach where we want markets to work. We want people to be able to build stuff. It, a lot of times when you hear that, it's, it's a very libertarian take where people want to get the state out of the way, and then they also want to cut the welfare state. And we have the view that, you know, the welfare state is actually very good. It's, it's good for society to have a strong social safety net. And there, that provides a lot of value. It lets people take more risk. It actually lets them be more entrepreneurial if they have something to fall back on. So we're people who are in favor of a pretty strong safety net while also getting rid of a lot of the bureaucracy and red tape and, and just what's called like kludge that stops people from building, whether it's building housing, uh, the same kind of stuff happens when they're trying to build green energy. The same kind of thing happens like with the big chips act that uh, President Biden signed into law, I think uh, last year, or maybe 2022, CHIPS Act allocates this giant pile of money to build semiconductor plants in the US because it's such a geopolitically strategic thing to do, right? That we want some of that here. And yet, despite this giant pile of money, very little of it, almost nothing has been actually allocated yet because there's rules. There's processes. You've got to bargain with all the unions. You've got to pass all these environmental reviews. You've got to import workers from Taiwan because we don't have enough skilled semiconductor workers, and that gets caught in. And it's just this endless list of things you have to do before any of the money can even be spent. And you know, Democrats are always very happy to cut giant checks, which can be good in some circumstances, but they're not willing to cut the paperwork and cut Your the red tape. red tape. Yeah, in order to make that cash work. Why do you think left and blue is in general more inclined towards like this bureaucratic sludge? Um, I, I think that, you know, part of this is just the nonprofit industrial complex where there's a little bit of like, I'm in nonprofit world and therefore, you know, I, I exist to create more work for nonprofits. There's, do you feel like the like nonprofits tend to lean left then? Because I uh, well, see like I, a lot of a lot of conservatives actually do a lot of like nonprofit startups. So yeah, well, uh, I, when I say nonprofit industrial complex, I'm coming from kind of the democratic side where I know more about them. And, you know, there's this thing, I, I think it's called the iron law of bureaucracy. I, I might be misnaming this. I'm sure somebody in the comments or in chat will yell at me, but bureaucracies basically always increase very rarely. If you give a bureaucracy power, 
will it say, well, we've accomplished our task. We can actually get rid of some of us now. They will collect new functions over time. They will impose new standards. They will find a new rule set. And some of this is very natural. Some of this is like, well, this one disaster happened that one time. So now we have a whole new set of rules to make sure it doesn't happen. But if you have this one disaster over the course of 20 years, you have 10 of those. All of a sudden, you've got this giant collection of rule sets that you've got to um, comply with. And it just always goes up. It never goes down. And there's a you know group of people working within that system who have no desire to ever see the system shrink. So are you saying basically in more blue areas, there's going to be more changes, more new projects, like more growth and progress, quote unquote, and therefore you get more bureaucracy just over time that's always interacting, whereas in red states, we're just seeing less of that progress as far as expansion, and therefore there's just less sludge to go through? I mean, I think it's more just that Democrats are more pro-government in general, just and historically have been, and so they are more likely to, to see the role of government as that to step in. And and I don't want to I don't want to make this seem like it's a um, it's always a bad thing. A lot of these impulses come from very understandable situations, like a, a lot of the local input on housing that I think today is is really strangling our ability to build. It comes from the era of Robert Moses, you know, and Robert Moses was famous for bulldozing entire neighborhoods without asking you know the people who lived there what they thought, and he would just bulldoze the neighborhoods to build a freeway. And he did this in a number of cities, and he especially did it through black and brown neighborhoods where, you know, back in the 1960s or whatever, nobody gave a shit if you did that because it was racist times back then. And so people looked at that situation and they very reasonably thought, hey, if you're going to build giant projects in the middle of our neighborhood, the community should get some input. And like, that's a reasonable thing to think on some level, right? But what, what kind of the, the political left learned is that what you need to do is you need to organize in order to stop things from happening. Organizing to stop things is good. Organizing and, and, and more community input, more meetings and more hearings is always good. And we're just going to keep adding more and more of that because how could it be bad to hear from the community? Uh, another example of this is like uh, the uh, what, what I call Captain Planet in environmentalism. Uh, I know you're a 90s, guy, 90s kid, right? I was born in 80s. So. You were born in 88. So you grew up in the 90s. Yeah, sure. Did you didn't plan it at Obviously, all? Obviously, of course. So Captain Planet, for all of our you know, Gen Alpha people watching, was this um, cartoon where like you know, five ethnically diverse children all had rings of power and they would combine them and Captain Planet would appear and, and he was this you know, environmental-themed superhero. But what's very interesting about the environmentalism of the 90s, if you remember Captain Planet, is that it was always about stopping some like factory that was like leaking the waste, leaking toxic sludge into the river, right? Mm -hmm. And that's always what it was. There's a landfill that somebody's creating, or somebody's got chemicals in the water, and it's always some businessman who's the uh, who's the villain. And you know, climate change was not even a thing back then. We didn't talk about it. Nobody really knew about it. But again, it's this kind of very understandable impulse that like we need to stop things from happening. And look, at, at some point in like the 70s and 80s, Cleveland's river was so toxic and polluted that it caught on fire. The river itself caught on fire. And this happened like 10 to 12 times. And so you can, a very understandable impulse, hey, maybe we should have more environmental standards. Maybe we should have an environmental review process. And, and that would be a good thing for large projects. But again, it's a whole generation of environmentalists learned, well, being an environmentalist is about stopping things from happening. We stop this power plant from happening. We stop this big project. And right now we're in a situation where the key thing for environmentalism is we need to build a lot really fast. We need to build solar plants. We need to build wind energy. We need to build more nuclear. We need to be experimenting with stuff like geothermal. And our environmental movement is not set up to do that because they're set up to stop things mostly. I feel like you have a huge problem too because it feels like if you go back to the... Um not the neoliberal, but the neoconservative days of like Bush, it felt like you had a Republican party that defended big business and all the things that ostensibly go along with big business. And then you had kind of the Democrats that were kind of opposed to big business. But I think post like Tea Party and all of that, now you've got a world where the Republicans don't really support big business either. And then Democrats for a variety of reasons kind of don't, except for kind of social media, except for kind of not. So it feels like it'd be really hard to find that impulse to actually protect some type of larger projects. Because I can think of, we talk about opposition to building houses or 
literally anything. I feel like Republicans will be against it for different reasons, but will be against a lot of the same things. Like if you talk about like high rises, um, Democrats are like, oh no, gentrification. And Republicans are like, oh no, I need my single family home because that's like the American dream. Or if you talk about building nuclear power plants or whatever, uh, on the left kind of, you've got labor unions that will fight against the expansion of green energy. And then on the right, you've got conservatives that will say that green energy is fake and they just wanna burn, I guess, whatever <laughs> they can set on fire for energy. Um, yeah, so it feels like right now you're in a world where you don't have like your your stalwart defenders, at least of big business like you used to on the conservative side. You've got a bunch of populists on the right. You've got people on the left that have never been big on pushing for any of these opening up of like developing, uh, you know, a bunch of high rises, a bunch of expanded housing, a bunch of green energy. And yeah, we're kind of like in a weird scenario right now where I don't know who would defend that. And then conservatives don't have any big cities really that they can speak positively of. And they can say, well, we could run all these things and do these things better. But the reality is, is there's a cash transfer from every large blue area to every small red area because they just they aren't as prosperous. They don't make as much money. They don't have any cities that they can even point to to say like, oh, look, these are big conservative cities that are doing so well. Even in Florida, I'm pretty sure Miami um, and all the other large cities lean blue. I know Austin is is almost like the San Francisco of Texas. So, mm -hmm. yeah, um, that's it, I guess. So there's there's yeah. one or two things I would say there. I think you're absolutely right. <clears throat> I think you're absolutely right in terms of the rhetoric that you see, especially coming from national politicians on, and I'll say this on a high level, Republicans are often no longer the party of big business or of capitalism being great. You, you'll see a lot of stuff like, you know, there's the senators like Josh Hawley who want to go after America's biggest companies. They want to break them up. There's a big anti-tech push, both from like the Elizabeth Warren left and the Josh Hawley right. And, and Josh Hawley is mostly mad because he thinks they're too woke. But like th this is a thing, right? They they've imparted the culture war onto uh, their what economic you, policy uh, yeah. onto the economic policies. But beyond the rhetoric, I think if you just look at the facts on the ground, there are some ways in which this is just you know, it is actually happening. Like the state that has the most clean energy, I think, is Texas. Texas has built an absolutely enormous amount of wind energy and solar energy, and Texas's grid is actually getting clean faster than anyone else's is that because of like republican policies or is that because of the blue drain that's occurring like is it is the clean energy in large part a uh, response of blue entrepreneurs moving there and finally being freed up because they don't have bureaucratic like red tape holding them back? and on a second question and also because i'm curious i've never looked into this specifically before but i'm very curious does it work in texas just because they have so much land that's also positioned decently for solar energy because of the belt that they're in for the sunlight and everything too yeah, look, look, geography is part of it, but mm -hmm. I, I would say it's it's not the kind of thing where it's like, oh, it's red entrepreneurs versus blue entrepreneurs. For the most part, entrepreneurs just don't think that way. They think, how can I make money? And I don't think that this is happening because politicians in Texas have some ideological bent towards green energy. I think it's happening because they just don't have as many rules that make it that make it difficult to. Um, for, for it to happen like I, i've written about this in the past how difficult some of these projects are there's a, a project off of the coast of massachusetts where they tried to build a giant offshore wind uh thing that would power like i don't know some giant percentage of massachusetts's energy needs but it was off of uh, martha's vineyard which has a lot of rich people that wouldn't like having their views you know interrupted by a windmill in the ocean um, and it, it got delayed and 12 years of lawsuits later, the people involved just finally said, screw it. We're done. We're not going to build it. Like we, we give up, you've won, we've defeated all these lawsuits and they just keep coming and we're done. And I think what's happened is that the invite, the regulatory environment is just better in states like Texas, not because, you know, the governor of Texas has a love affair with clean energy, but just because they got out of the way to some extent. Um, and then your second question. Sorry, what was the second question? Um, geography? Oh, yeah, yeah I was yeah. curious how much geography affected it. I, when you talk about like the cost of um, building things, I, I wish I could remember. I, remember was, I don't know if it's here in Europe, but like I think the cost of building nuclear power plants, I've read that a big factor into this is like fighting activists and everything because there's so much that goes into like the public pushback. Yeah. I mean, even for things like the Keystone Pipeline and everything, like the amount of pushback on every single square meter that, you know, this pipe might run under and mm -hmm. everything else is. Yeah, and, and yeah. I'm not an expert on nuclear. The one thing I'll say is that, it, first, you're absolutely right that a lot of the cost of nuclear, the reason why nuclear seems to be so much more expensive than, um, than like solar or, like or wind or whatever, 
it, Peter, but... is because of fighting activists and because of how long the process takes. And the, the Nuclear Regu Regulatory Commission, the NRC, uh, is the regulatory body that kind of uh, lords over nuclear. And for the last 30 years in function, their role has been to prevent any nuclear power from being developed. We had a bunch of we had a bunch that we developed like back in the '60s and '70s, and then we just had like no new plants for decades. Um, the other thing that I'll say is that because of that, because of that gap where we just prevented anything from being built, we lost a lot of the knowledge, and that's also why it's expensive. You know, somewhere like France that just kept building nuclear power plants kept you know pushing their costs down because they were continually training people who n would know how to build it, who would know how to run it. Every time they built it, it got a little bit cheaper. There's, you know, gains from learning. But if you build a bunch in the 60s and 70s and you go 20 years without building, then all the engineers who knew how to do the stuff have retired and you've got to train an entirely new generation of people and you lost all that learning. Like that's part of it as well. So um, I, I, not an expert on like nuclear power, but in general, I think this is just a thing that happens all over America and it's. You know, one of the things that we are passionate about is kind of freeing the economy from the red tape that it's in w without having to go like full Ron Paul libertarianism or whatever. Um, so, yeah, that's it's just a something I can obviously talk about. Yeah, I'm, I'm so very curious, passionate about it. We zoom back out. The goal is to obviously change uh, the trajectory of democratic politics. And so if we talk about, for example, um, getting out of the way for business to be successful. How do you recommend, like, do you recommend that Democrats like slash down all these um, groups that are environmentalist groups and all sorts of things? Like, how do you recommend the Democrats go through if they've got all this bureaucratic sludge to clean it up without losing basically what in many ways would probably make the state blue, which is caring about environmentalism and caring about, um, you know, like low income individuals that will be disproportionately affected by ugly, unsightly structures being zoned in their areas and not rich people's yeah. areas. So there's two things I would say to this. Um, I would say that in terms of environmentalism, we've just we've got to switch the environmental movement's focus. They've got to stop being focused on like save this little, you know, three-toed, uh, you know, the the three-footed nematode or whatever it is. That kind of environmentalism just I, look, it, I I'm sure that the three-footed nematode is a very cute little animal. Somebody's probably posting like links to it in chat because maybe it actually exists. But it doesn't matter when you're talking about climate change. Climate change and the impact climate change will have will, you know, cause the extinction of a hundred other, you know, different an types of animals and plants and whatever. We've got to ca stop caring about like these very weird localized things because th this absolutely happens. Uh, one of the foundational laws of environmentalism is called the National Environmental Protection Act. It's NEPA. And the average length of a NEPA review when you are required to get a um, an environmental impact statement is what the thing is called. Those average environmental impact statements, I, if I'm getting the statistics right, I think they average 660 pages and four and a half years to complete. And this is for like anything for, this could be to build a solar plant, but some group sues and says, well, the solar plant will actually displace a herd of sheep or something. And so you've got to do a 600 page report that will take you several years. And we've just got to get the environmentalists to realize, look, climate change is the overriding thing here. That's what we have to care about more than anything else. We've got to build this energy. And we've, that we just have to set that as a priority above the sheep or above the nematodes. In terms of housing, that's also an environmental issue because when you build dense housing and you have dense cities, that's way more environmentally friendly than suburban sprawl. Um, dense housing is kind of de facto environmentally friendly you could people create these kind of heat maps of who uses the most carbon in like say a metro area and wherever the housing is densest that's where they use the least carbon because they do less driving and when they do drive they drive shorter distances and you know so i think we just we have to th there's ways we can kind of align progressive goals like fighting climate change helping you know poor people with the idea that we can get the government out of the way and those things can still happen. Sure. I think that's really interesting. I guess when I think about this, when you said like environmentalists are focused on like the cute nematode instead of global warming, obviously as like uh, an unschooled internet person, all I hear about is global warming and I don't really hear about the specifics, which makes me wonder. Um, there's a really good article by Scott Alexander where he talks about, it's called Criticisms of Criticisms. Mm -hmm. 
And he talks about basically how you need to move between macro and micro criticisms. And I, I like the lens because it makes you think about policy at macro and like narratives at macro and at the micro. And so when you're talking about like environmentalists think, fixating on the wrong thing, I'd be curious to know, like, I bet you the nematode environment, environmentalists who are stopping the solar panels probably also tweet and post and are concerned about um, sure. energy, but they're just also concerned in the local areas because it's impacting them locally. And so they're like, well, how do I put these? Like, it's like a priority issue, you know? So if we zoom out, if we look at the, the, the micro versus the macro, the micro is that we've got a bunch of disorganized groups all around the country. A lot of times these lawsuits comes from very local groups. This is not like Bernie Sanders is suing to stop a solar plant. But, you know, the, the Sierra League or the Sierra Club, I'm sorry, of Vermont very much has sued to stop those kind of projects. Local Sierra Clubs, local just Audubon societies. And these are things can't they can't be centrally controlled. It's not like the Democratic Party can just put out a message that says, never do that again, guys. And, and they'll just do it. No, they're autonomous and they'll do what they want. And so that's the micro. The macro is that we have a system that some people have called a, a vetocracy which is that there's way too many veto points in the in our bureaucracy, that there's way too many opportunities to just stop something from happening. It's way too easy to file a lawsuit. There's too many regulations that allow you to do so. And so it's very easy for little micro groups like that to sue and stop something or demand that there be an environmental impact statement that will take several years or just make different demands for community input and we have such a vetocracy in so many different ways that the macro level picture is we've got to solve the vetocracy. We've got to, you know, do permitting reform so that it's it's just faster to build stuff. It's faster to build whether it's semiconductor plants, whether it's uh, green energy, whether it's new housing, whether it's nuclear plants, whether it's you know anything at all. It's got to be faster to build, and um, you know it. That to me just seems like a win-win. Everybody wants more stuff. Everybody wants there to be, you know, more technology and better technology and cleaner energy and more abundant energy and and more cheaper housing where we pay less for rent. Regardless of your ideology, everybody thinks those are good things. It's just a matter of how do we get them. I feel like the problem is the opposite. The way that you say that on the micro level it's disorganized and on the macro level uh, there's other issues. I feel like the issue is. On the micro level, I think it's actually, it's a lot easier to organize. I'm kind of saying the same thing in the opposite words, but on a micro level, it's very easy to see one particular problem and then gear an organization or a lawsuit around. It, fixing it's easy that to one coordinate. Particular, exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's very easy to focus and fix it on that one thing. But then on a macro level, like if I've got the choice between, you know, demonstrating to prevent a pipeline or to save a particular animal or whatever, it's very easy to get engaged with that. But if I want to fix global warming, I've got you know, Twitter and Facebook, and that's about it. I don't know where you plug in for that. So I feel like the plug-in points on the local level are a lot easier for people to have that, con like, concentrated effort to do a particular thing. But then on the macro level, it just feels kind of lost sometimes. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree with that. There's uh, Global warming is a decades-long, high-visibility fight, but it's the kind of thing where, you know, if you pass a law, it's not like you can see the law working. You've yeah. just got to wait. Hopefully, the climate will get hotter at a slower change. rate people yeah. feel like that all of the all of the environmental problems are completely intractable and we've made really big progress in certain areas and people just don't realize it as much uh i didn't go to la as a child but i heard that like the smog alerts and everything mm -hmm. in la used to be like unlivable um back yeah. in the 90s and stuff and that massively got taken back by different regulations and restrictions one of the reasons why california has so many different restrictions on stuff related to pollution and everything yeah or when we were growing up you mentioned that we weren't really talking about climate change there were two things that we were talking about though one was acid rain acid and i remember rain. when that was supposed to destroy the whole planet where where all the rain was going to be like the blood <laughs> from aliens um and the second thing we talked about over australia i think was the hole in the ozone yeah um yeah, yeah. It's, it's so funny i wrote so there's an article i wrote um i think it was for the bulwark um, called progressives have turned into processives. Mm -hmm. They care about process more than progress. Um, but those are the central examples that I use in the article. And look, I, I think that like n the environmental movement, which I'm criticizing now, it genuinely did have some big wins. These are, you know, we fixed acid rain. We fixed it, by the way, with a market mechanism. We did a cap and trade system for the particular uh, chemicals that were causing it and just limited it to a certain amount, capped it, and you can blah, blah, blah. But it was a very market oriented system and it worked. And within like three or four years, boom, done. Like that's a clear win for the environmentalists. The hole in the ozone layer 
is not entirely closed, but it is definitely healing. We've we banned um I think they're called chlorofluoro It's like something. CF, 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 CFCs or CFCs, something. CFCs, yeah. chlorofluoroclides or something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm not a chemist. Um so but yeah, we banned those chemicals and, and the ozone layer is healing. Even the whales to some extent, which not all the whales, but like some of the species of whales actually have been saved. Mm -hmm. So like we we've, we've had big wins. Cleveland's River doesn't set itself on fire anymore. Like Good job, Cleveland. And so I, I just, I, recognizing that we've had those wins, I want us to be able to shift into a different mode of like the build baby build of environmentalism where we can just, just a buttload of solar, you know, power and wind power and battery technology. And, you know, the thing is, if we do, like, the technology part of it has been solved so hard. Solar power costs literally less than 1% of what it cost 20 years ago. Like the, the price declines on solar and wind have been insane. We're not just getting clean energy. It's also going to be the cheapest energy anywhere in the world very, very fast. And battery technology to store all that solar is also getting really, really, you know, at more efficient at a startling pace. Like technologically, we've kind of technologied our way into a solution to all of this. We and, we're, the, and we're just not doing it. The, yeah. it. So, yeah. Um, okay, so zoning and houses, I talk about this a ton on stream. Um, Energy-related stuff, we've talked about this. Uh, do you touch on the social side of things at all when it comes to yeah. new liberalism? So, obviously, there's there's a strange mismatch between the number of people on the left that advocate for extremist or whatever, like far-left woke stuff, versus the amount of people they actually that actually exists in the Democratic Party, right? So if you go online on Twitter, it looks like 50% of the Democratic Party or more are like super woke. And the reality is a pretty small percentage of people in real life that seem to dominate these conversations. Uh, how do you approach that or address that, I guess, with people? Do, do, you, do you get the general sense of people who feel like it's overwhelming or? I mean, I, I do think a lot of people think it's overwhelming, but on both people who are coming at it from many different angles. Uh, it, it's the culture war. And anybody who engages in the culture war for long enough will become brain poisoned and just lose sleep over it. Whenever I talk about stuff that touches on the culture war, I, I try to just go back to core values. We are social liberals, and you know, it, I think that's the core of what we want to be. And so, on on any given issue, I, I can talk about different stuff, but it means that we are supportive of you know LGBT rights. We believe in kind of the the core social liberal values too, though, of you know, just uh, the rule of law, for instance, it, that. All people are created equal and should be tre treated equally before the law. And that, you know, um, I, I don't know, just kind of this very basic philosophical liberalism is part of that. Uh, on the culture war stuff, you know, it, we're going to side with kind of the democratic position most of the time in terms of if you want to talk about particular bills about like, do trans people deserve to participate in this healthcare program or something like that, we're, we're going to mostly say, yeah, you know, and, and it, it's tough to talk in specifics because every state wants to regulate every state has this weird mishmash of like how they are trying to treat gay couples and trans individuals and things like that and you i'm sure you can find some instance where they're treating them in a horrifying way you can find some instance that maybe is an overreach but like in general we're going to be supportive of, of people who just want to live their life in a way that's authentic to them and is not bothering anybody else um, so I, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a complicated topic because so much is, it is wrapped up in the culture war and LGBT rights and social liberal values. Like it's an enormous amount of different things, but that's kind of where we stand it, it, to give a 10,000 foot view. Sure. Um, besides, let's see. So zoning stuff, energy stuff, uh, liberal stuff. And like the initial question was like, what are the big, like what are your yeah. huge ideas that you kind of yeah is there any other are there any other huge areas of stuff that you focus on or that you feel like the yeah. democratic party has lost its way on that you want to like reorient people around i mean so the the biggest things for us I, I would say there's a few issues that our members really really care about housing is one of the very biggest ones immigration is another one where we are very very pro immigration um and it's it's a tough thing to be in today's political climate um but we we believe immigration is a really net positive thing for America and for for most countries, but especially for America. You know, a country built on immigration. We think that immigrants contribute positive ways economically, culturally, um, and just that immigration 
in general makes us stronger and it's it's kind of disheartening right now the turn that's happened where all of the energy politically seems to be on restricting immigration and you know the, the crisis with asylum seekers it is a legitimate crisis the system itself is badly set up and it has caused a lot of dysfunction and i don't deny that the system needs to be fixed but because there's so much chaos and because people see reactions to the chaos Nobody likes to think of their border of their country as being in chaos and there's a caravan of people coming and that that gets people very worried. And so it, it leads them to be like, well, let's just shut everything down. That's that's the voters instinct. And so it, it, it kind of bothers me that that's where we are. But th that's the reality of kind of politics right now. But we are going to continue advocating as best we can for the idea that immigration makes America stronger. And we if we let in more immigrants, if we had you know, certainly a stronger system that was less chaotic and, and, but, and, you know, make some of those illegal immigrants legal because there's such a high demand to come here, build a better legal system for them to come in. America would benefit enormously. I think that's one of our biggest things. Um, I, I think th there's other kind of issue areas. I think the last thing I would mention is just a general pragmatism that even though we are ideological, we have a set ideology and we have a point of view. We believe things, we have core values, but alongside those values, we also have the value of pragmatism that you've got to be able to work with coalition partners. You know, as much as I criticize the far left, um, I, I know that most of the time we can work with them. You know, we, the Nancy Pelosi's Congress had a majority of like three seats and still passed a number of huge, very, very, you know, influential bills that could help a lot of people. How does it look when you guys, when you say you have policy positions, which I'm curious, when you have like an organization, how do you figure out what those positions will be? So for instance, um, I think, was it Ezra Klein and I think Nate Silver wrote an article recently or have been writing recently about like Biden dropping out. Yeah. Um, if you guys have, I don't even know actually, when I say you guys, who, who's in charge of like, this is going to be our <laughs> position on this, or this is how we feel about this. How, how do you even make those decisions? Like what the... I mean, that's, it's interesting. So we are like a membership organization. You know, we have uh, several thousand members all across the country. Um, I actually don't even know. It might be more than that at this point. Um, like when you talk to me yeah. right now about like the policies or the positions that you guys stand for, do you decide those? You're like, I think most of them are like this. Do you pull people? <laughs> well, You've so, got like a few people yeah. on board who are like, ah, these are going to be our positions or yeah, how do you resolve those disagreements? I'm sure there's a lot of disagreement in the group sometimes of. Yeah, I would say so. A lot of this developed organically. It, it, it's we developed in a very interesting way where, you know, the two founders are myself and Colin Mortimer, who um, Colin is is uh, currently running the organization day to day. He's like the the director of the organization who handles all the day to day stuff. I'm more like I, I handle some of our media stuff. I run our podcast. I do a lot of writing and a lot of appearing on shows like this. Mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm the pretty face, okay. you know, so it, sure. It, sure. <laughs> okay. So I guess you guys don't vote then. For, um, but so. But when we founded it, it wasn't like, well, Colin and I just were two guys who had an idea and we went and founded an organization. It started very much as an outgrowth of social media spaces. We, we started a subreddit uh, called r slash neoliberal just because we thought it would be funny. Just because like, hey, we need a place to talk about politics. And we both, you know, there's some of us over here who voted for Hillary Clinton and we got called, you know, dirty bootlicking neoliberals by Bernie Sanders internet support by Bernie bros on the internet. Mm -hmm. And so we're like, okay, fine. If being like an Obama Hillary Clinton voter is being a neoliberal, then fine. That's what we are. And the thing is that grew really fast. It grew much faster than we expected it to. And it, co it collected the kind of person who believed in the stuff we're talking about, who is like capitalist, but also believed in a supportive welfare state yeah. who believed in you know, cutting red tape, who believed in immigration and trade and building more housing. There's a joke like in my fan base, yeah. we call ourselves like omni liberals, but it's, I think it's largely in alignment with the neoliberal subreddit where it's basically like, hey, liberals do a lot of good stuff, but some of it's kind of cringe on the progressive side. And hey, you know, like markets are real, we should respect them. Yeah. And yeah. that position, it's so strange because in the real world, a position is, I would say, pretty well represented in the Democratic Party on the lawmaker side, although obviously there's things they could do better, but online, there was none of that. And I feel like that neoliberal subreddit, uh, grew in, in proportional response to the explosion and then the subsequent uh, fall of bread tube. 
Yeah, well, and there's... the red soup stuff exploded. Like the neoliberal server also kind of grew up, and then neoliberal was like yeah. the N word for political people <laughs> online. It's like the worst thing you could call somebody. You <laughs> neoliberal fucking show Margaret Thatcher, Reagan. Yeah, blah, 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 it, blah, it was blah. a slur word for yeah. a while. In the same way that socialist used to be, like in the '90s, you know, mm -hmm. or, or even going back, like Michael Dukakis got called a, a liberal by by George Bush the first. And back then, liberal was a scary word. Dukakis or um, Dukakis was like, no, I'm a moderate Democrat. Like I'm not a liberal. And so the, the which words are scary changes over time. But yeah, you know, there was this moment in 2016 where like it seemed like all the energy online politics was either with the Bernie Sanders left or with the MAGA Trump right. And if you were just kind of if you felt like, well, I'm just a normal person who thinks Obama was pretty good and I wouldn't mind four more years of something like that. There was like no no space for that conversation. Were and you then, a Bernie bro? And um, twenty sixteen was a first, yeah. In twenty sixteen, I was a big Bernie bro. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we all make mistakes, so you know. <laughs> but wow. <Okay>. But <laughs> why weren't you more Clinton or Obama? Because uh, I was young and stupid. Oh, really? I mean, so you regret two thousand in two thousand eight. I was a massive Ron Paul supporter. How, wait, did you say you? How old are you? Uh, I'm 36. Okay. Yeah, in 2000, I was a massive Ron Paul stan. And I remember we all watched TV when, did he win one state in a primary, I think? It was like, he had he never had a shot in hell. I can't even remember, it was, but it he might have won one, yeah. Yeah, there was the same Ron Paul math that there was the Bernie math to figure out, like, well, actually, I think Ron Paul can win <laughs> if he just does these things. And then, yeah. yeah. Um, Bernie, was a, Bernie was a big one in 2016 for me because I felt like I was just obsessed with lobbying and all the talking points. And I thought that there were like, these were the things that were destructive. It was like big business and capitalism and lobbying was destroying everything and blah, blah, blah. And I just had a very naive and crude view of politics. So I disrespected my now recognized queen of Hillary Clinton and her political shrewdness. <laughs> and um, yeah, but uh, I mean, yeah. It but yeah, so just to circle back on what we were saying, though, it's like that kind of happened organically and it kept growing. You know, we uh, the subreddit grew really fast. And then we started a Twitter account and that started getting really a lot of followers really fast. And, you know, what does everybody who has a mediocre Twitter account do? You start a podcast um, and the podcast started to get like big guests on it. We started getting like members of Congress coming on. And at some point we just realized. And YouTubers too, right? Yeah. And like, YouTubers. Like Destiny? Destiny. Wasn't I, yeah, thank you. You were one of, you were one of the <laughs> first so 10, two. I think. Yes. I think you were one of the first like 10 people we had on the Good. podcast. Okay. Well, that's um, true. And now and, you're popping his cherry. So and and now here we are. But <laughs> but yeah, at some point we just realized like we've got this giant community of people. We need to make this an actual organization. We need to solidify this into something real because like without anybody prompting it, people were like, hey, there's a bunch of us in New York. Let's start having meetups. Hey, there's a bunch of us in San Francisco. Let's start having meetups. And those actually became our first local chapters that we now have like 60 or 70 of. And so just at the, we we the whole thing kind of the the views and the values were created organically through this process and i think that's why it's been so successful is you know th there's there's a long history when if you get into like dc think tank lore there's a long history of like centrist democrats being really mad that all young democratic activists are like super lefty and they're, they're like we're going to start like the young centrist organizer group but it's always a group of like 65 year old men who are like doing it from their point of view and trying to fund it and so it always fails spectacularly and this has happened many times like i'm not i don't want to shame any organization in particular but they deserve to be shamed to some extent but the reason i think ours has been uh, grown a lot faster and really endured and and is succeeding to some extent is because it grew organically it just created itself and then at some point we were almost forced into making it a real organization mm -hmm. so it, when you ask you know where do the values come from they were kind of created in that organic process. And then we have some people who are now, you know, a, a full-time staff of about four or five people who are running the organization, the national organization, and who help figure out, you know, who do we want to endorse, uh, you know, on a local level, local chapters figure out what they want to endorse, you know, in terms of laws and in terms of city council members and things like that. Do you guys have plans to do like a conference or anything like that? Uh, we've had a couple. We had our first national conference in 2022. Um, we had the second one last year and we are having the third one this year. And uh, I think we had, we, we had 200 to 250 people, okay. uh, at the, at those, where do you hold those at normally, uh, in DC. Okay. Yeah. Cause uh, we always are asking, you know, elected officials, members of Congress, and occasionally one or two senators, if we can snag them, mm -hmm. it's harder to get senators, Yeah, I can <laughs> imagine. Yeah. but, uh, they are more willing to drop by your event if it's in DC. So what's the biggest guy you've gotten so far to drop by? Um, we've had Hickenlooper speak at one of our events. Uh, John Hickenlooper is a senator from Colorado. 
Um, Jared Polis is uh, is a big fan of ours. Um, who's the governor of Colorado. We've actually had a lot of success in Colorado. Colorado Democrats are like my favorite Democrats in the country. Okay. <laughs> um, and and like Jared Polis, the governor there, calls himself a libertarian Democrat, which is like, <clears throat> hallelujah. They're just amazing. So, okay. um, and we, we've had, I don't know, at this point, 20 to 25 different members of Congress at our events or at, on the podcast or on our live streams that we've done. Um, so uh, it's, you know, it, we, we also all like to get like academics sometimes too. Some we'll have an academic who researches housing or re researches immigration come and give uh, talks to our local chapters or things like that. And, and those are always great events too. So I feel like there's a circle of pretty popular Twitter people that kind of fit this ideology a little bit. Mm -hmm. Maybe, um, do you know, like the Medlock Twitter account or no opinion? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Do you ever interact with any of these people or do they fall a little bit too left for you or do you just no interest or? So this is going to be an odd question out of context, but uh -oh. ha have you ever, have you seen the neoliberal shill bracket? At any uh, point? Yes, I think I have. Yeah. Yeah. So we run a contest and this was something that started, I don't know, five or six years ago. I think at some point somebody I, I told Colin, Hey, we should have a March madness bracket in terms of like, Hey, let's like do a basketball bracket that we all participate in. And he took it as, Oh, we should do a bracket of our favorite neoliberals on the internet. And so we created this like 64 person bracket of like Twitter characters or whatever mm -hmm. and elected like who is going to be in, in a big tournament style format, who's going to be the chief neoliberal shill. Um, Cause again, it, anytime you identify as a neoliberal on the internet, you get called a shill. Yeah. And, and so we just embrace it. And, you know, who are the and, winners of the last two? Um, so the first two winners, I think were Noah Smith okay. one and Matt Iglesias also yeah, okay, won. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, last year it was Matt Darling. Okay, who, I haven't seen them on Twitter. His but. name is Best Trousers on Twitter. He's the guy who's always correcting people about the usage of median, if you've ever seen him there. It's okay. a very niche. I mean, I say niche. He's got like 40,000 followers, but he's like a very econ Twitter kind of micro celebrity. Um, but yes, we've. It, it's normally like, yeah, think tank people or writers or stuff, like people who are popular with very online policy nerds, mm -hmm. is what I would say. Do you find that like a lot of people that are involved in you? Because you're like in a very... It's interesting because I feel like your sphere is not a sphere that. What? <laughs> I'm sorry. I think I just remembered one of his tweets that blew up. Um, fuck. I'm sorry. Who I just, Matt Darling? I think it was yeah. Because yeah. somebody it didn't somebody tweet out somebody was talking about something to do with median wealth and somebody was like yeah but like what would this look like if you cut off all the absurdly rich? People? Yes. It was, it was uh, yeah. So yeah. No. So th there's sorry, a joke. There's a joke. Just you're just I, I can fill this in. Stupid. There's a joke where he's like. Oh. You thought his was no here. I, 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 I his was correct. I can, I can fill okay. it in. So okay, somebody okay. was like, "This is what this is what Matt is famous for, Matt Darling." So it's, he'll be like, somebody will be like, "The media, you know, all Americans are broke and have a million dollars of student loan debt," and he'll post a piece of data that says, "Well, the median American has you know ninety three thousand dollars in net worth." And they'll be like, okay, but what median American, what if you take out Jeff Bezos? Yeah. And he posted, well, it goes from 93,000 to 92,999 and 99 yeah. cents. Because yeah. obviously taking out one person of the median of doesn't the median, impact. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. It's a very, very nerdy joke that so I've just way over explained. All the time instead of like, okay, okay. He, his his thing is very patiently correcting dumb people on Twitter in such a way that they get like embarrassed, but he's very polite about it. I don't know. Yeah. And for, I guess for those not following exactly, um, an average or a mean is where you just add everybody together and then you divide by a number and you can get averages that are skewed. If you've got 10 people, uh, nine of them make one dollar, and one makes a you know hundred billion dollars. Then your average wage between all these people is really high, whereas a median will exclude the the more extremes, um, and then you get a more accurate picture of what's going on. So when somebody says like, oh well, what would it look like if you actually cut off like the Jeff Bezos or whatever? It would look like the exact more. same. That's the whole point of a fucking median. Yeah, this is right. this has been uh, Algebra 101 for uh, yeah. Gen Alpha. You know, for all the 13 Stats year olds watching, you're welcome yeah. for your uh, your homework help. Okay, you're asking questions. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. <laughs> No, you're good. I actually, no, I know. I love taking a digression into like, let's talk about what this Twitter niche micro celebrity did. It was <laughs> one. It's such a bullshit, but it's the kind of bullshit I love. So you know, whatever. I can't believe that Medlock got um that he, that fucking guy made that stupid fucking bet with him. <laughs> yeah, James Medlock. Was it a free? It was a million dollars, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. What, it, what was that guy saying that a dollar would be worth less than a? It, he said the dollar was going to have hyperinflation, and he was going to do the, so he, in he, ninety was days. He really absurd, or was he a left? He was a retard. He's, 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 I believe that. He's a, he's he's a, a crypto way. guy. He's oh, a right leaning crypto he's a right -leaning guy. Yeah. Crypto dude. But he, like, when he says hyperinflation, he defined it very, 
like well he said it was going to happen in 90 days yeah and it was like a days. huge like hyper not like five percent inflation or ten percent it was a huge number yeah. it was like an obviously lost bet yeah and i think i had said along with a ton of other people that if even if he accepts with medlock i, I didn't believe it even with a um, you didn't think he would actually go through with it no way it was such an obviously stupid he did. bet he, did, he did what a yeah. dumb <laughs> how much was on the line a million dollars and i think he gave it with big odds to medlock too didn't he he bet so oh what he gosh. what he bet was a million dollars against one bitcoin which yeah. at the time was worth about oh, thirty thousand dollars that the inflation was gonna yeah yeah that's so much well oh. and the funny thing is that like it, medlog's whole thing was i'll bet you a million dollars there's not going to be hyperinflation because if there is hyperinflation giving him a million dollars actually wouldn't be painful exactly. because of hyper and be so like medlog like said it as a joke like i'll bet you a million dollars there won't be hyperinflation and then balaji said yes <laughs> and they did it like yeah anyway so enough of the weird did econ he pay nerds. do we know yes he, he did. did that's why i was that's so angry crazy. no it's yeah he oh should have never he didn't deserve to get paid that bet that was such a stupid <laughs> that was such a dumb bet nice for medlock oh, man. damn that's anyway so funny where were we before this <laughs> that's okay um i wrote down something about speculative risk and social media um because i i know you're really interested aside from like your uh center for new liberalism or whatever you are really interested in social media Yes. Um, and analyzing it and talking about tech and stuff like that. Um, and obviously the most like common question about social media right now is like polarization and how it's contributing. Um, but what I think was kind of interesting, you were talking a lot about like, um, you said progressives, I think you said progressives are more concerned with like process over progress. Could you maybe explain that a little bit more of like what you mean? Well, I mean, so we've been, I, I feel like we've kind of done that at length, but just for one more time, it's like, Pretend, yeah, pretend the, it's really dumb and I don't understand, so. I think a lot of it goes back to these lessons that were learned decades ago. Yeah. And, and a lot of politics is people learning lessons way too late and then applying them in the wrong circumstances. You know, that you could argue that this is what the the, uh, the Iraq war was, that, you know, we, we saw a bunch of democracies spring up in the wake of the Soviet Union uh, falling apart, right? Like the the Baltics, Latvia and Estonia and Lithuania all became very strong democracies and Poland became a strong democracy mm -hmm. and the Czech Republic was a strong democracy and the, you know the Germany integrated together really easily um well not easily but really well in the end and so we looked at this and we said well if we toss Saddam Hussein out uh well six, six months boom democracy that's all it takes and we had overlearned the lesson of of the 90s and that was not the case and i think that this happens in um progressive politics where they learned a lot of lessons about like it's really good to stop things it's really good to have a lot of bureaucracy that stops things because otherwise robert moses will pave over your neighborhood because otherwise this factory will just dump a bunch of chemical it's waste in our rivers and they learned that lesson at a time when it did apply and are now way over applying it for the last several decades when in reality our challenge is no longer that robert moses is going to pave over a neighborhood our challenge in our urban areas is that we don't build enough housing and we haven't built enough housing for decades. And so we have a cost of living crisis and we're using the tools from some bygone era where process was really important to solve a problem that it, it process only makes it worse. Sure. So I guess like when I think about like social media, I guess maybe I'll start like more zoomed out. Do you feel that social media has like a major impact on electoral politics and like real politics or is it like just entertainment? A absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the, we used to say in, in the earlier age of the internet, like, you know, poli Twitter is not real life. These internet fights are not real life, but that is absolutely not the case anymore. Like the internet is absolutely real life. Every, every member of Congress is jealous. Every member of the democratic caucus is jealous of how much attention AOC gets on the internet. And how many likes her tweets get like it's it's petty nonsense but i'm telling you i've talked to staffers chiefs of staff and and different people who literally tell me like my person is mad that they don't get attention on social media and they're jealous of like different members of you know who do and th this happens on the republican side as well where you know crazy people like marjorie taylor green and lauren bobert you go viral like crazy matt gates gets a lot of attention online yeah. and um you know, I, I think one of the things that happens, because um, you mentioned polarization, I think that the internet is specifically kind of structurally set up to increase polarization and extremism. And, and there's a good example that I like to use that's non-political, where the, the most successful influencer in the world is probably Mr. Beast. Mr. Beast has 240 million, 250 million followers. Um, he's just an enormous presence. Every child in the world 
more children probably know who Mr. Beast is than who know the, than the U.S. president. Um, he might literally be one of the five most fam famous people in the world. Um, I'm kind of speculating, but that would not surprise me at all. And he initially got famous. His first video that really popped was um, he, he was getting his first big sponsorship, his first ever big brand sponsorship. And they said, we want to sponsor one of your videos um, and we want to give you $5,000. And his response to them was, give me $10,000 and I'm going to give it to like a random homeless guy on the street. And I promise you it'll go viral. I promise you this video will be massive, but 10, it has to be 10,000 because the number is bigger. And it, you know, it's a five digits instead of four. And they said yes. And it was by far his most successful video ever to that point. And so then he did it again with 20,000 and he did it again with 50. And he, he's now at the point where like all of his videos are like, I'm giving away half a million dollars. I'm giving away a private Island. You know, mm -hmm. to, if I'm going to buy a plane and the last person to take their hand off of the plane gets it like it's all this crazy stuff. And what you learn watching his videos, like I, I don't love his content or whatever, but on the Internet, the most extreme version of something always wins. It wins the battle for attention. It wins the battle for clicks. It wins the battle for virality, because think about why would you watch like I gave a hundred bucks to a homeless guy video. If you could watch, I give a thousand bucks or I give 10,000 bucks or I gave a house. This is something he's done, by the way, walked up to a random homeless guy and said, I have a house three blocks that way that I will just give you. And, and he gave it to them. And like this kind of like the bigger you can go, the better it is. Do you know every single Mr. Beast video? Jesus <laughs> I, Christ. I know, yeah, I, know a, I know a lot of <laughs> else we're posting in 2017. <laughs> my God. But so, um, the, the structural point though, is why would you watch something smaller when you can watch something bigger? And this is obviously true. You know that this is true in terms of viral videos. And a lot of people structure their YouTube videos and their TikToks this way. And it's true in politics, too. You know, if somebody proposes, well, I think we should have a wealth tax. Let's do a, a nice, reasonable half a percent wealth tax because that's the highest one that any other country has. And other than that, they usually fail. Blah, blah, blah. OK, fine. I might not like that idea, but somebody's proposed it. And then some other Democratic senator can just swoop in and say, well, I'm proposing a 2 percent wealth tax. And somebody else can go, these other candidates aren't real progressives. I'm proposing a 4% wealth tax and the online crowd will just eat it up and eat it up. And this is not actually a hypothetical example. Because what did I say? Wasn't there, was it a Congress person or a state person? The $50 somebody, minimum wage. Yeah, somebody was fighting over some of yeah. the minimum yeah. wage around like a, a week or two ago. But yeah, the, the, even the, the wealth tax is not hypothetical because uh, in the 2020 election, Elizabeth Warren came out with a plan that said, I want to do a 6% wealth tax so that if you're above a certain wealth, uh, level, they take 6% of your wealth every single year. Mm -hmm. Three days later, I shit you not, Bernie Sanders came out with an 8% wealth tax just because he had to be the biggest and the best. And it, it's, that really, I felt like I would have remembered that 8% wealth tax. It must have been yeah. over $100 million or something. It, it's stupid, all, it right? would only have applied to like billionaires. But yeah. yeah. But like just that, it's like, well, if she can do it this progressive, I can go one step further. And the thing is, there's enough people on the internet that one step further never stops. And that's where you get into these. Bizarre these positions, happen, though. Like, I guess, like when I hear that, like, does this just lead to? It's like a different form. Like in the yeah. past, we were used to politicians promise a lot of things and then they never give it. Is it just the same version of it, but the viral version, or do these policies actually get implemented? So there's an interesting book here that talks about the promises specifically, um, and I, I talk about this book whenever I can because I think it's a really, really important book. Um, it's by Martin Gurry, and it's called Revolt of the Public. And he published this in like 2010 or 2011. And he was mainly talking about like the Arab Spring or maybe it was like 2013. It was like right after the Arab Spring. And that was his main thesis about why is the public, especially in Arab states, discon discontent. And but it's he applied it to our like uh, Occupy Wall Street here. But it explains so much of the Trump movement and so much of the current progressive movement. And basically his thesis is that mass media has changed. Politicians have never really lived up to their their promises. They've always promised a lot of stuff and then kind of not delivered. Maybe they delivered on a few things, but not much. But the media apparatus in like the 50s and the 60s was set up such that it wasn't really highlighted that they didn't fulfill all their promises. You know, the, the mainstream media used to basically just cover for politicians. Everybody in the mainstream media knew that JFK was having, you know, like... Uh, sexual liaisons with all sorts of people, but they never covered it. You know, you can think about how they didn't talk about FDR's illness. There was kind of this code of omerta where they just, everybody covered for everybody. One of the examples that's really funny here is like JFK invaded the Bay of Pigs 
and it was a massive failure, right? It's this thing where he tried to invade Cuba and it just flopped hard. I think the big thing was he didn't invade. <laughs> yeah. I think they pulled support at like one of the last moments. Right? But, but the whole thing was just a fiasco, right? And the front page of the New York Times, like a week later, was like, you know, Kennedy still learning, you know, from experience of ba like, and they, they framed it as like, well, he's a young guy and he's just learning. And this is the front page of the New York Times. And can you imagine that happening today? And the thesis of the book is basically that modern communications, modern media, and especially modern social media have made it such that failures to live up to promises are now in way like such clear, stark uh, clarity, I guess. Mm -hmm. Such clear clarity is a beautiful phrase. Um, but it, it's so obvious now, and it's so instantly able to be called out when you don't live up to your promises. And that leads to just endless disillusionment. It leads to people like Trump who say, I, you got to burn the whole system down because everything is corrupt forever and people believe him. And it leads to people like Bernie Sanders who say the entire economy is rigged forever and you're never going to get ahead unless we have a revolution. And people believe that because, you know, that they, they can now see that, you know, well, politicians promise things and don't deliver a lot more clearly than they used to. I'm kind of curious. So to be... One billion percent clear. Everybody has issues with misinformation. Everybody propagates misinformation. It's not a problem. It's unique to one side. But I will absolutely say that the conservative side has gotten hit way fucking harder with it than on the left. Do you have a theory for why that is? Or do you even agree with the premise? Um, I do agree with the premise. And um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure why. I think part of it has to do, and it, I think the real question is, why is there a conservative media and mainstream media? Because some you know conservatives will like to say well the the mainstream media is liberal the mainstream media is progressive but the new york times is not the same as fox news like fox news is worse in some regards and certainly if you start getting into stuff like breitbart and one america news network and the the collection of online blogs and sites and the general e media ecosystem essentially there is mainstream news and there is conservative news mm -hmm. and i think there is progressive news, but it never has it, caught on as much as it, think like, about like how much power is in like those like one American news network or the podcast network of the right or yeah. whatever, as opposed to like, you know, Air America was a thing for a while and then it died. And like, I don't I mean, know, Bannon like, had influence in the White House. What did, yeah, the, like there, there's yeah. like the young Turks are not a tenth as influential as their conservative counterparts, you know? Yeah. Who is their conservative counterpart? I don't know like somebody somebody like Breitbart or well, the Daily Wire, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then it depends on how much we stretch it, but like the Tim Pools and the Joe Rogans definitely carry a ton of weight for or a ton of water for, uh, for Trump and everything related to him as well, which is also really frustrating. Yeah, so I think it's above my pay grade to figure out like why did the media ecosystem develop that way? It may be related to conservatives having more distrust of the system, more distrust of the media institutions, and, and liberals having a sort of inherent trust, especially with education polarization. Maybe now that liberals are all the educated folks, they tend to trust institutions more. I, I don't know if that's the correct answer, but I think the reason is that there is conservative media and mainstream media, and that's why disinformation and that, that whole ecosystem is much worse. Right, and like on the left, when we're getting into like, you said like polarizing is virality as well, which is why like far left pundits tend to be the most popular, particularly among young people who are most consuming online media. Yes. Um, so like, would, cause you would obviously like Hassan and like, there's no other comparison on the far left. For I, I was wondering how wire. long it would take to, for us to mention Hassan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Here, but <laughs> God, I think we got over an hour. So, <laughs> the, yeah, you know, I pretty good, it, pretty you know? good. Yeah. An hour and a half before we brought him up. So do you think AOC's virality helps her career? Uh, absolutely. Think it gets her elected and absolutely stuff like that. it helps her career yeah so do dems so like i i see a lot of valid criticisms of trump but i guess there's a question that i have because i have a i feel frustrated when i see dems especially being really concerned with sanitization on twitter and all these sort of things so they're very very afraid of brand risks um as somebody who's like tried to like work with a number of politicians on behalf of steven um he's a constant brand risk for example um which I think there's some level of validity. Okay. I believe in you. Listen, I don't need them. I'll be around longer than any of these losers are, okay? I'm good. Yeah. All right. I mean, part of just the nature of being a politician is that you're obviously concerned about what people are going to think about you. And so brand risk, they're all, they're all going to think about it. And even the ones who are like, you know, they think about it in different ways. The ones who are in safe blue seats will think about brand risk in terms of like, 
oh, well, I, it, does this person said something about Israel that is going to get me in trouble right. in my deep, deep blue progressive district? Whereas somebody in a swing seat in a purple district is going to be more concerned about like, am I, you know, talking with people who are way too left because I am in a swing district and I really need to be a moderate, like pragmatic, sensible candidate. Yeah. So they're worried about different things, but everybody thinks about this kind of stuff. Right. And I also wonder if there's like this cultural difference, because I feel like when I look at what Gen uh, Z, sorry, uh, people tend to think about, they want authenticity. They like the AOCs, right? They like um, who's the new trending TikTok House Congresswoman who has all the charts? Does anybody know what I'm talking oh, uh, about? Oh, Katie Porter. Katie yes. Porter. Yeah, Katie, yes. Katie uh... Porter. Don't you love Katie Porter? <laughs> <laughs> but these people um, are so popular amongst young people, which I could argue is does it help their career because young people basically never vote? I mean, a AOC is probably going to be the next senator from New York. When it, whenever Schumer decides to retire, which would, I don't know when that's going to be, he's very old. Yeah. He, he might just stick around, though. He, he can stick around as long as he wants. He will win re-election as many times as he wants to, I think. But AOC is probably the favorite to succeed Wait, him. is that true? Do people think that? Is I, AOC, you I think, think that, yeah. Well, do other people think that? That's a do you think strong thing. I don't actually know. I have no idea. I'm not sure if that was. I, I would. I don't think I'm saying something super controversial. You know? oh, okay. I feel. I feel like the uh, when it comes to House leadership and uh, Senate leadership, I feel like they tend to be more moderate, mainstream appeal. Well, like so I, I think parties, AOC right? has done a quietly good job, and like that, I do obviously agree with I, that absolutely. I, I am a. Um, I am a. I, like I said, I have an ideology. I don't pretend to be unbiased, and so I am the kind of person who is on the more pragmatic Democrat side rather than the far left Democrat side. And so I'm never going to agree with all the things that like the squad does. Mm -hmm. But with that said, there are some members of the squad who go, seems to me, go out of their way to be like confrontational and to cause problem for the for Democrats and to make Democrats look kind of crazy. And I think AOC is not doing that. I think AOC actually works within the levers of power. She like worked with Nancy Pelosi rather than screaming at her all the time. She is more reasonable in her public statements, I think, in a lot of ways. And so I think AOC like plays the game in a lot more intelligent way uh, than than some of the other members of the squad. And and I appreciate ab that about her because you know sometimes in Congress you're gonna you have to build coalitions. We have a two party system, which means that both of our parties by necessity are coalitions of people who are not going to always agree. So the AOC wing and the new liberal wing are going to have to find ways to get along. And AOC actually makes that effort. I don't think that other members of the squad always do make the effort. But I think AOC is actually like she works within the party. She's respected within most of the party. Mm -hmm. mm, so. Interesting. So then I guess, do you see like a shift that would occur? Obviously, the way that this like unsanitized appearance would look for each politician would be different because they're representing different constituents, right? Like somebody who's repping a California district or California broadly is probably going to have a very different feel online than somebody representing like Ohio. Yeah. But do you see like a shift because of social well, media? And, that... and it's not even just that. Like it's not California versus Ohio, just to be clear. It's, um, I think, gerrymandered district versus ungerrymandered district. Because mm -hmm. one of the problems that we have is that we have a ton of gerrymandered districts all around the country. And what that means is that we have a lot of safe seats, a lot of extremely deep blue seats and extremely deep red seats that are not, you know, like the, the number of seats that are actually contested to some reasonable degree has been trending down over decades. Have you dug into like gerrymandering a lot or districting? Not a lot, but enough to know that like we used to have more competitive seats. That nowadays it's le legitimately out of what, uh, 435, 438 uh, house seats, 50 or 60 maybe are, act are legitimately up for grabs. It used to be a lot more than that. And, and so the districting, the gerrymander question is actually really interesting because I, I think that gerrymandering and, and any in any society that you would construct in the United States, I think it's actually necessary for Democrats to win, for there to be some level of weird districting, just because of how closely Democrats tend to cluster together, mm -hmm. such that if you were to draw the the fairest and most accurate districts, meaning a district that seems to resemble a cohesive yeah. unit. Just in, using a mathematical formula, for instance. Or whatever. Yeah. Well, not... I'm not necessarily because, because there, there, are, there are states that kind of do that where it's just it's purely mathematical. But but I think it, it's the same thing that you're saying. It that, maps onto something that yeah. feels like, oh, this is like a district. I feel like I'm part of this district as opposed to like a sliver line that tries to relate like these people will be here with these people that are cut together yeah. or whatever. But because Democrats live so close together, if you were to draw out every district like this, they would they would be non-competitive. You would Demo never win. Democrats just because do self the, Yeah. Yeah. Because the um, when you when you're if you're trying to gerrymander effectively, you're not actually trying to make seats uncompetitive. You're trying to get a slight edge everywhere. 
rather than packing all of your people in, in one area. And because conservatives and liberals tend to be um, in the place conservatives live, tend to be a little bit more equally apportioned than in cities where it tends to lean way more blue. If there's not kind of, some kind of weird districting, Democrats have like no hope of actually winning uh, structurally. Um, I mean, <clears throat> I'd, I'd need more. I need to like look at maps to, to say that. But I, I think that. I just think the district, know. the districting, the gerrymandering problem is very interesting because there's not, there's definitely not a clean solution to that. I don't know what it would look like to solve for gerrymandering stuff. I feel like I read something at one point that said that there should just be representatives for like the state and you have like, um, you don't draw the districts, but you basically do like a, a, a population size and then you apportion out representatives yeah, like that or something. But proportional rather than, um, than uh, member districts. draw yeah. like Single, yeah, members or whatever, but yeah. Um, could, yeah. I, could I back you up? Um, when you said there's only a couple of the seats that are legit up for grabs, just again, because I'm a dumb Canadian, can you explain why that would be the case and what would make a seat more up for grabs than something that isn't? Like why specifically gerrymandering makes these seats so safe and makes them basically non-competitive? Well, so when you gerrymander, what you're trying to do is guarantee your guys are going to win a lot of districts. And, and, but you, you're working with a certain state. You can't change the voters of your state. Mm -hmm. But what you can do is say you're a Republican and you are in charge of a state that's like 55 Republican, 45 Democrat. In, in a fair system, you'd have roughly that amount of Republicans and Democrats being sent to Congress. But instead, what you can do is you can create a district that's like 95% Democrat by just drawing it weirdly or just you know doing whatever. And so the resultant rest, that's only one seat. You're giving the Democrats the safest seat ever. And then you can give yourself a bunch of 60, 40 districts off of that where, you know, they're close ish, but in, in, unless something crazy happens, you're never going to see the 60, 40 really s like flip unless you have the worst candidate in the world. Right. And that, that's generally the method that we use. And again, if you just look at like pure number of like how many congressional races out of, you know, they happen every cycle, there's 438 out of those 438, how many of them are within five points, for mm -hmm. instance, the number has been trending down over time. And so it, we just used to have a lot more competitive races and, and now we don't. And I think that's a problem because when you have these highly gerrymandered districts where more and more people are safe structurally, that means more and more people in Congress can be extreme because all they really have to worry about then is losing their primary. Right. They're not worried about the general election. They just don't want to be primaried by somebody from their own party who's mad at them. So they go even further to the right or even further to the left. And the, you know, the number of people who are actually in these purple districts where they've got to appeal to a more regular person, that's, they have to be that, much more safe. that's shrinking. Yeah. You also get this weird, dumb, like fixation on vulnerable, vulnerable seats. And then like this ignoring of like 85% of the country too, because everybody will focus on presidential elections. It has to do with swing states, yep. um, for Senate elections. I remember for the runoffs in Georgia, I think they were saying that for those two elections for Warnock and also, I think over a billion dollars were spent in that one state <laughs> because the entire country was so invested. Yeah. In, and, and by the way, can I, can I say you were down there, right? Yeah. Uh, can I say one of the things I, I, I love about you is that all these, there's a lot of people out there who talk about politics on the internet, but there's so few people who get off their ass and go do something. And for you to have like motivated hundreds of people to do that, I think is just phenomenal. Like I, you've probably gotten praise about this before, but I want to join the praise pile, the hug awesome. pile or whatever. Our next yeah. project is, I think I've got 99 other people. We're going to Israel. We're joining the IDF soon. <laughs> We're going to be part of the strike cells that are indiscriminately bombing Palestinians. It's going to be our next exciting project. Uh, so, no yeah, comment yeah, there. Yeah, check so. that out. Um, but no, I mean, legitimately, like, are you familiar with a book called uh, Politics is for Power? <laughs> yeah. Are you familiar with that book? Yeah, I talked to Eaton Hirsch. Eaton, Eaton Hirsch, right? Yeah, Eaton yes. Hirsch. Yeah, 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 I brought him on. I actually interviewed him. Yeah, that was actually a really good book. I, I've interviewed him as well. The, the, that book is phenomenal. And... Okay, well, I interviewed him first. So yes, well, I probably read the book first. And you probably interviewed him You probably him only better. read it because you heard that I read it. Probably. Do you still talk yeah. to him, though? Have you um, messaged him since then? Do you still talk to him? I just got coffee with him in New York. We were actually both you. making, you're we actually lying. called in a bomb you're threat lying. to your uh, plane and that's why your flight was canceled this morning. And uh, that's my flight was canceled this morning. If you've messaged morning. him once since then, you're already one up on the- on uh, the I have not about. talked to him probably in at least six to eight months, I think. So I don't When's know. When's the last time you talked to him? Yesterday. Uh -huh. There you go. But no, I, I, I love that book. And the point of the book is that, you know, if, if, you're, if your entire engagement with politics is that it's something you post about and then never do anything, that's kind of, number one, it's poisonous for democracy. Number two, it's probably not good for you personally. And you should either care less about politics or do something, get off your butt. And, and even if it's just attend a city council meeting and advocate for what you believe in, 
just do something. And I, I love that you guys did that, that you actually get people out canvassing and, and, you know, off of the internet, we're just having arguments. Yeah. I don't know. Do you think that, um, do you think Biden and Trump are both going to be on the ballot? Yes. This coming election? You think? you think it'll be Trump? Yes. And you think it'll be Biden? Yes. I think that there's a lot of free money in prediction markets that you can go bet right now that it, uh, you know, you can still get like 80 cents on the dollar, I think, or something like that. And mm -hmm. I, I think that's like free money. Do you? Do you think it'll be Biden and Trump? I do, but I was, um, because I got called on to, um, do that Piers Morgan show over Trump and uh, Biden, and I was reading a bunch of articles beforehand just to see if there was anything new going on. And apparently, a lot of Americans aren't really sure right now. Like the average opinion, a lot of Americans aren't sure if Trump or Biden are going to be on the ballot. Yeah, that's one of my favorite things. I I agree. I've seen this where like something like twenty five percent of Americans just straight up don't believe it will be Biden and Trump. Even and, I and, don't believe it's not. It's still, it's kind of hard sometimes when I look at him. Like, who do you think's going to be in place of Biden or uh, Trump? I can understand it would probably be Nikki Haley if it's not Trump. You don't think it'll be Haley? Who do you think's going to step in between? It, the there's no good answer to that. The Republican Party is in shambles right now. I agree. Now. Like, that's because true. if Trump drops and Haley, like if Haley joins, then it would be a third party. Trump would just run as a third party, and it would because the, the average Trump Republican is not following Nikki Haley yeah. anywhere. No, for even sure if not. even no. if like Trump gets hit by a bus or something and dies or, or whatever, you know, <laughs> ghost does, will be Trump, yeah, Air yeah. Force Trump, whatever his plane blows up and, My and God. whatever happens, he has a heart attack, he dies. Even then, yeah, the 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 MAGA wing will get behind somebody other than Haley. Yeah, that would be her. the end of our country. I think every all resources, the most important thing we can do for our national security right now is ensure the health and safety of Donald Trump because if he <laughs> dies in any way possible, oh my God, the the, it is over. It the conspiracy theory? Yeah, the, yeah, it would be unbelievable. He could have a heart attack and people would actually think that Biden got the death note and killed him that way. Like it would be, it would be completely over. <laughs> Or if he has an overdose in a hospital, people are going to think Hunter Biden snuck, you know, crack cocaine into yeah. his IV or whatever. He could die it would just be... on camera, live on Twitch with uh, a heart attack and say, I'm dying of a heart attack and nobody else is doing this yeah. to me. And people would still think it's If you funny. thought QAnon was bad, then. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Whenever Trump does yeah, kick the bucket, that's going to be a bad one. Yeah. Um, but I mean, Democrats have a similar thing where like, it, look, it, generic Democrat always polls better than whoever is the current president, right? Generic Republican polls better. Um, but. The, the issue with the Democrats is two things. Number one, the likely people a poll worse than Biden. If you like Kamala Harris, who is by far the most likely if Biden drops out, she polls worse than him against Trump. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's funny because Nikki Haley polls better than Trump. And so it's kind of confusing why they don't nominate her if they want to win. It's because it's a cult of personality. But again, if they cared about winning, they would nominate Haley. But if Democrats Ooh. cared, Haley would, I, I think, if she got it somehow, um, Haley polls just clear like 10 points better than Trump against Biden. How many problem, vote? Sorry. Oh, I was going to say the, the problem is like it's such a macro level change. It's kind of like when people say like, oh, uh, if Germany just didn't invade the Soviet Union, the whole world would be controlled by, uh, you know, these powers. Yeah. Or like if this one thing would have changed here, then the entire world would be different. And it's so hard to predict past a certain point. Like there's a lot of dominoes. Saying, yeah. yeah it's, it's totally possible that if Trump drops out, a bunch of MAGA people grumble for a month or two and they're like, well, you know, we're, we're not voting for the Democrats. And then they follow behind. Are they all they fall in line behind Haley? It's also possible that they all, you know, keep in mind it would only take what like four or five percent of Republicans to break off to like irreparably destroy the Republican Party for a decade. Yeah. Like only that percentage of people. And if they were to be like, we're gonna go vote independent for Vivek yeah. uh, or something like that, it would be yeah, it would be <laughs> catastrophic for them. But but beyond um, that, just like yeah, generic Democrat always polls really well, but the problem is that the people who would actually be that generic Democrat, like we had we have generic Democrat. His name is Dean Phillips, sure. and he is essentially the same position since Biden. He's, he's not got a lot of policy differences, except that he's younger, and he says he doesn't have his baggage. Yeah. And yet nobody wants to vote for him. It, there is no appetite anywhere for Dean Phillips. Because for generic, I don't like the generic politician line, because it's like, yeah. at that point, you don't even have a human being. You've got like Yeah, this... my, my point is that it doesn't work. Exactly, it, yeah. Generic Democrat no real... polls better than Joe Biden, but there is no generic Democrat. We've mm -hmm. tried it, and it doesn't work. And Joe Biden is what you've got. And the other thing is that even if you if you did this, you would end up having some sort of weird contested convention and it would lead to all the parties, all the wings of the Democratic Party fighting each other bitterly and everybody would hate each other and we'd lose because of internal conflict. Probably yeah. that's the other thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, th this is just the thing like you might not like how old he is. And I get that. And I get that there's maybe some it's not great that he's that old. But when you when you are the president, you run for reelection. That's what always happens right. yeah. there is there how long has it been since we've had a president who didn't run for re-election how many voters do you guys think i'm super curious obviously um especially because the two-party system is just 
quite novel to me and quite interesting, actually. How many voters do you think that maybe would fall right now into the Nikki Haley camp that are conservative might end up voting for Biden because of their distaste for Trump itself? Or do you think those voters would inevitably, if Trump is there, would they just abstain and not vote? Or would they vote for Trump out of like begrudging partisan solidarity? I mean, I, I, I don't have a strong opinion on this other than it, it's a non-zero number for both groups. There are some Haley people who are voting Haley because they are a principled anti-Trump conservative and they will not vote for him. That I exists. Like the I feel like it'd be like 97% of Haley voters who vote for Trump over Biden. Though. I think like the they're going to be more loyal to the partisan party. Then. For the party, for sure. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I, I don't have a good feel for whether it's more or less than that. Uh, but I, I do think there are some that, and, and the other thing is I think that some of Nikki Haley's votes probably come from Democrats who want to keep her in the race longer. Yeah, that's probably so, true. Like in know. the primaries right now? Yeah. Do you guys, I guess maybe if I can broaden it, this is kind of a side tangent, so tell me if you don't want to talk about this, but the two-party system is interesting in and of itself. Do you guys see ever the American system splintering away from a two-party system? Like, is there enough counterbalances within your three branches to do that? Um, like if Trump became a third party, would that create that spark like this revolution where now like three, maybe four parties begin to exist? Or do you guys see the country staying two party kind of indefinitely? I mean, there's an interesting law of political science and I forget the name of it. You might, maybe you know, where it says that if you have a first past the post system, like we have that, um, and like Canada has, that inevitably those systems always collapse into two party systems. And this is a law in the political science sense, which means that it doesn't universally apply and caveat, caveat, caveat. It's like a social science law. But but it is a pretty strong-ish result throughout uh, the democratic world that first-past-the-post systems tend to be that way. America is that way. The UK is that way other than like, like the Lib Dems or like in reality, it, UK politics is the conservatives, the Tories and the uh, and labor. It's It's mostly two party. And like in India, you see, like, again, there's regional parties in India, which complicated a little bit, like one Indian state will have a special party just for that state. But in general, it's the Modi party versus Congress. And right. like, those are the two. And in Canada, it's the conservatives versus the liberals. And, and the, the NDP, are and the NDP up, exists, yeah. but like the NDP has never held the prime minister, ministership, right? No, they're, n they're not. And they were suspecting there, maybe the Jagmeet. There's been a lot of liberal prime ministers. There's been conservative prime ministers. There's never been an NDP prime minister. But so there's again, been NDP the, uh, states, like yeah. provinces, which but, is But so it's, it's kind of, I think it's a pretty strong law that most first past the post systems just tend to be Two party. Two, they fall into two parties. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's, it's not universal. There's exceptions, but you know. Yeah. That's so. super fair. Um, so I, don't, I think coalition governments suck. <laughs> like uh, multi party systems? Yeah. Like Canada has? I feel like they have all the. I feel like, I feel like there's a grass is always greener thing where people look at two parties and they go, like, oh, this is no fair. It sucks yeah. and blah, blah, blah. But I feel like coalition governments run into a lot of issues too, namely where. Um, I feel like we heard over and over again about how Manchin and Cinema were destructive to U.S. politics because they were controlling the entire political system, and this is literally the worst thing in the world. These two senators <laughs> have so much power. But then I look at coalition governments sometimes, um, especially like in Israel right now, right, where Netanyahu has to make concessions to these insane conservative uh, parties that are very, very, very small. But the only way you can build your majority government is to align with these crazy, very, very That's small parties, tracks. and then these people end up having a, a, a disproportionate yeah. say over your platform's politics. Um, which is very frustrating. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not saying necessarily one is better, one is worse, but I think sometimes people overhype the coalition governments or overhype these multi-party yeah. systems. They think they'll solve every problem, but they have problems in of themselves. I, I do think it's funny how the most successful like third parties in first past the post systems are almost universally like regional ones, like like the Bloc Quebecois yeah. in, in Canada, which is just a bunch of angry Quebecers. <laughs> angry who have, French people are mad uh, at Who have folks, just yeah. weird French language issues that nobody else in Canada cares about. In, in, in the UK, it's the, uh, the Scottish um, National Party, the mm -hmm. SNP, which, you know, is, is very, has won Scotland a ton of times and always gets a bunch of seats. And in India, again, they have regional parties and stuff. like. It's always just like ethnic stuff. And, but as far as like the national parties, usually they're still just two. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Um, I guess we were talking a bit about sanitization. I actually wanted to like go back into that then, because I I feel like we didn't flesh it out. How do you feel like politicians need to like balance the line then, on media on internet between being unsanitized versus being 
uh, interesting and like viral? Like, is there a balance that they're supposed to strike? Because it's weird to have politicians who essentially to some degree need to also be entertaining, um, which is like what creates virality. Um, do you see that like negatively impacting the type of people that run or the type of politicianship that and like, then occurs? Even on the back of that, because I feel like after Trump got into office, we, we got this constant, like, is politics changing forever? Is the politics going to be different forever? Is politics, what is what does the new post-Trump politician look like? And they look about the same as the last ones. And even though Trump, it's strange because Trump in some ways showed that you could break a lot of the traditional paradigm of basically everything, that you can fuck porn stars while you're married and pay hush money to them, um, that you can talk about, you know, women's pussies privately and raping them or grabbing them unconsensually, or that you can make fun of prisoners of war. You can do all these insane things but then it seems like now we're at this era in politics and the average politician is still more or less the same. Like it feels like the, the answer to that question was, no, Trump didn't really change anything. Or should they change? Yeah. I mean, so th there's always been the phenomenon of the media hungry politician. And back in the day, it was that they always wanted to be in the local papers. They wanted to be written up. And then in the age of television is that they always wanted to be on television. And when cable came out, they were, they were all jockeying for spots on cable news and they still do that. And now social media is just another part of that, right? So the, we can acknowledge first that this has always been the case. Politicians have always been people who want attention. And, you know, I, I think to some degree, this is always going to be the case. And social media is just a new expression of that. I think there are a lot of politicians who would benefit from recognizing that their skills are elsewhere. You know, there's, there's a lot of people who, frankly, it doesn't really benefit them that much to be on social media because... All they have to do is make the people in their district happy. And, you know, maybe in their district, like, um, I, I don't know, there, there's a big uh, fishing contingent because it's a it's on it's in Maine and it's like the all the lobster fishers. And so all they have to do is be real good on lobster issues or just something like there's a lot of these things where like things are actually way more hyper local than we realize. But what what happens is that, you know, politicians like anyone else are influenced by the people around them. There's that common saying, like, you are the sum of the the average of the five people you spend the most time around mm. and you know that's kind of bullshit but kind of true in some ways and all of their staffers are super online poisoned you know gen z people yeah. who spend way too much time on tiktok and twitter and arguing about politics and who love it and who are energized by arguing about politics and so you get a lot of these you know congress people who traditionally would have been they wanted to get on you know, in the papers, on TV, but to talk about their stuff, to talk about how I brought a base back to our district. I, I brought a factory built by the federal government to our district. And it's very local stuff, like real meat and potatoes kind of politics. And now they all want to wage the culture war. Right. Now, now the kind of archetype of the successful media hit is not bragging about something you did specifically for your district in order to win specific votes. It's like moral posturing It's, about it's moral BLM posturing or... about the culture war. Yeah. It's about, you know, somebody uh talking about how the wokes are ruining society or whatever matt gates stands up and talks about how wokeness is is cultural marxism or, or whatever the case may be like that that kind of nonsense has increased dramatically do you think it's a result of specifically like not just trump but like it seems like trump capitalized on something that nobody else was really willing to capitalize on before and that's why he I suspect I, I mean maybe you guys might disagree with this premise but I suspect why he has such a strong cult of personality is because he was willing to like defy all these old political rules which really appealed to the anti-establishment type conservatives yeah. especially do you think that it shifted as a result or would you agree I mean, Stephen, I, that it happened? I think that um I think that uh, Trump there's a lot of people who thought like I can be the next Trump or I can use some of his playbook yeah. and the thing is I don't think they're right I think that actually it's very hard to do what Trump does without being Trump like the people who've tried to be Trump, and just and they, they they haven't it hasn't worked very well because he's got some like thing where he's just he's never been shamed in his life. He'll do all this stuff. And I think his superpower to some extent is that he has no shame, like zero negative shame where he'll, you know, say, oh, I like prisoners who weren't I like soldiers who weren't killed instead of respecting dead soldiers or whatever. And people will get, you know, the, do the finger wag in the media at him and he just seems to not care and he just r rolls with it and i don't think anybody else can do that as effectively as he does so at least in terms of the the kind of trumpist playbook of like have constant scandals a, a new scandal every day just to make sure you stay in the news i don't think anybody else can play that like and most people can't weather the scandal most itself. people most people can't weather the scandals the way that he does magically somehow do you ever have a dreamcast growing up 
uh dreamcast like the game system yeah uh i had a nintendo i never had a dreamcast but i know but like a nintendo original or are you saying nintendo like a boomer like you had a nintendo 64 and you call that a nintendo i had um Wait, isn't that a nintendo? i had a no super Nin i had a super nintendo there was my go. first okay. one that's yeah. a real nintendo. one why is yeah. a nintendo 64 not a nintendo because you wouldn't call it a nintendo okay it's just that it makes sense okay right? yeah that when the, yeah, the 64 passed... was called the 64. Yes, yeah. but not a Nintendo. When you, but uh... was it a Nintendo? Was it like a box that you played games out of? Nintendo yes. would have been like yes. a higher classification. It was it. made by the Nintendo uh, Corporation. When the Dreamcast like came out, it had a lot of capabilities and features that were revolutionary, but the world wasn't ready for them, I don't think. So when it came to like <laughs> online play, like I don't think the world was quite ready for the, like the internet infrastructure wasn't there. We were still using mm -hmm. uh, phone lines to hook up our stuff and we had dial up and... Yeah, I just don't think that there was that broad societal support for what the Dreamcast had to offer. So that system flopped horribly, and I think Sega basically quit the console market as a result. I feel like when people look at Donald Trump, sometimes I think of um, Donald Trump as like a Dreamcast that hit the, at the right time to where people will look at Donald Trump and they'll be like, oh, you know, like Donald Trump can get away with all this crazy stuff because he's Donald Trump. But I don't think it's just because he's Donald Trump. I think it's because he actually slotted, and not through any political like knowledge of his own just by luck he happened to slot into the right place at the right time so for instance that making fun of POWs or whatever making fun of prisoners of war that wouldn't have flown 20 years ago but in a world where america is traumatized by our foreign policy experiences in iraq and afghanistan maybe you can make those jokes you know or when it comes to uh you know I don't know, things like infidelity or stuff like that, that maybe Republicans don't care about this as much because they're fixated on other cultural things, like they're worried about losing to the woke schools and stuff, so they've got like a little bit more leeway here. Yeah. I think that I think that Donald Trump is he's not just a unique person, but he also came at a unique point in time as well. Like his prior to running, I don't know if a lot of people remember this. I forget this sometimes. Do you know do you remember what Donald Trump's first foray into the political world was? Um it depends on what you define as political, but I, I'm, the two things that come into my mind are him um, making a bunch of statements about like the Central Park Five. Kind um, of. And little. then also he got involved in some big public infrastructure projects, but I don't think that's what you're referring I'm to. I'm going to refer to something bigger. It was that Obama birth certificate stuff. Oh, uh, yeah. Was yeah. huge. And he was like the primary pusher of that. And I think that him being that huge pushing of that him aligning with uh, Sheriff Arpaio or Arpaio in yeah. Texas, and that coming at the same time as kind of like the, it was the R, um, the Donald subreddit, and then it was the QAnon stuff on 4chan, and then it was the explosion of like the online Facebook groups that all of that conspiratorial stuff and then all of that Trump stuff and then all of the hatred for the foreign policy stuff and the and then you could, you could throw in like the intellectual dark web there a lot of them yeah like migrated into Trump and then Amer and then yeah. Republicans finally understanding why some people don't like big business but it just happened because they got woke and they're yeah. like well wait maybe unions and protections and maybe these people do need to be broken up I think that Trump was just at the perfect epicenter of all that happening so when people try to duplicate Trump they look too much at the qualities that he has and not the fact that he just happened to slot in at the perfect time for the person that he was yeah. I think. Well, so here's, um, you want to know my favorite uh, piece of trivia about Donald Trump? No. Oh, no, okay. I'm just kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So when Donald Trump ran against Hillary Clinton and you asked people not who they were going to vote for, mm -hmm. but who is more moderate, Trump okay. or Clinton, Trump was viewed as more moderate. More people said Trump is, is more moderate as opposed to Hillary Clinton. Probably was. And yeah, this is like, I mean, it, it always depends. Moderate is such a shaky word and you mm -hmm. define it however you want and what do you count as left wing and moderate and right wing but like that would i think shock just stun a lot of people on the democratic side that anyone could think donald trump was more moderate but it's because he was doing it in a way where like you know the the republican party consensus for a long time had been we need to you know cut medicare and cut social security yes. and you know do all this cut blah 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 and and donald trump was like I don't care about that. Mm -hmm. Let's. I love Social Security. Let's make it even better. Let's make it bigger. Let's have triple the Medicare because he because he didn't know anything about it. So yeah. he's just he's like heard the applause when people were like he said he would protect Medicare. Okay, I'll just keep saying that. You know, and he he called himself the king of debt. He had no commitment to yeah. like cut the budget deficit and be a serious fiscal conservative. You said that people were like the last five people they've spoken to. Trump is like the last audience that clapped for him. Those yeah. are like the positions that he has. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and and you're you're right too because I feel like uh, retrospectively we went through eight years of Obama and the Republican position politically at that time was literally stop Obama at all costs from doing literally anything. 
And that was the extent of the Republican Party. So we went eight years with no real conservative leadership. And then Donald Trump shows up. And truly, and people forget this, I argued with another big um, political streamer. Oh, God. I forget the name of him because he's fallen off so much lately. Um, <laughs> he's Turkish. Hassan. Um, yeah, so we got into a big argument over whether or not Trump was a successful president. And I had actually argued that I didn't think he was that Republican or that successful, I think. Um, because... They, uh, the walkbacks from the traditional Republican positions. Remember, the Bush was considered right the neoconservative, big business, hawkish foreign policy. Republicans would pay lip service to immigration, but they wouldn't really do much about it. Yeah. Um, and then compare well, I mean, that I mean, back in the day, Republicans there was a big pro-immigration Republican wing. Like sure, because of all, yeah, because of all the cheap labor, yeah. <laughs> right, and the economic boon, right? And then you got this like uh, populist anti-establishment conservative that came in, and you're right, in some ways, there were hardline conservative positions that were unequivocally unchallenged that Donald Trump didn't care at all about. Like, if you were a Republican, you were always hawkish on foreign policy. That was like a non-start, like non-negotiable. You always, and then Trump was like, I don't care, I think we should be out of all of that. I didn't even support the Iraq war, even though yeah. he kind of did until it became unpopular and blah, blah, blah. Um, I think at some points he was talking about how like, yeah, you should jail women for abortion. But I think he also said he didn't care about funding Planned Parenthood. I feel like he said something terrible of that early on. Um, there's obviously like the porn star, the five wives, the everything in his family. Yeah, in some ways, Trump was actually more moderate on that old left-right paradigm than Hillary Clinton. But well, and, and you have to remember so that ways, yeah. it, it's, it's tough to win three elections in a row. It doesn't happen very much. It doesn't happen very much in American politics that, so we, one party holds the presidency for eight years, right? And then you also get, you know, just a continuation of that. The last time mm -hmm. it happened, I think, was Reagan winning twice. And then George Bush the first got mm -hmm. uh, got a kind of a third term of Reagan, mm -hmm. but you have to remember, George Bush the first didn't get elected as saying I'm going to be even more Reagan than Reagan was. He got elected because he was seen as like the more moderate influence on Reagan. He was the moderate Republican, whereas Reagan was more in the conservative wing, and that's how he was viewed. He was a walk backwards from Reagan. When Hillary ran. You know, and you can debate whether you personally think she should have been more progressive or more conservative or whatever, but she definitely ran to the left of Obama. She ran markedly to the left of where Obama had governed, and she had promised to be, you know, partially in response to Bernie Sanders because he was challenging her from the left. Thank so God she supported 15 an hour minimum wage. So, she, yeah, so yeah. she ended up drifting leftward. But, you know, Obama had been a pretty successful president, got reelected, passed some big things. And um, and she said, well, we're going to go even further in that direction. And like that's that's, what her, that's, her that's dangerous. You know, you can do it. Maybe you think it's it's worth the risk. But, it you know, running away from the center is a is, is a risky strategy in American politics. Yeah, I think there is a lot of there's a lot of stuff for that election. I think Hillary Clinton had a lot of accumulated damage from Republican <laughs> attacks, basically, for forever. I agree. She had um, she had several decades like. If Joe Biden had run in that election, I think he probably would have won. Do you think she was like the least electable uh, like Democrat that they could have put up just because of all of the smear campaigns that have well, been running against she her? She wasn't the least electable because Bernie Sanders also ran and got 40 percent of the primary vote or something like that. He was the least electable, I think. There was but... an interesting argument to be made that he might have outperformed her in the general because he was picked up on that anti-establishment uh, sentiment more. It's hard to know for sure, but... I've, I've heard that, and my response to that, not to get deep into... I don't care to refight 2016, like okay. whatever, but just briefly on that, like, he had so much dirt on him that That's was, true too, that was right never now. brought up because yeah, really? Hillary Clinton went so far out of her way to play nice with his supporters. She said, well, he's getting, like, she's not going to win, but he's going to get, like, 35 to 40% of the primary vote. I need to play nice with him. But, like, he was in like Nicaragua with the Sandinistas chanting here, there, everywhere, Yankees must die. That's sure. on tape. And the Castro and, stuff and, the, and like, the weird articles for the he took his He took his honeymoon to the Soviet Union back when it was actually communist. Like, there's so, none of this ever got brought up because the Democratic Party, the mainstream of it, played very, very nice with him. But in the general, I think he, I think he would have been like eviscerated. Like the Republicans would have destroyed yeah, him. Yeah, I think the Republicans yeah. would have had a field day with him. Yeah. Is there somebody else that they could have put up, like, because the Joe the... Biden? I think I think Joe when Biden could have won. Biden hadn't recently. Um... I think his son had recently died in 2016, mm -hmm. and he did so not he want, to, want to. Run. He didn't want to run.
and he lost and, running and, against well, he, did he run obama against obama also, in 2008 uh yes but yeah, he dropped out very early yeah. and and supported him but no in part of it is that obama didn't really support joe biden running in 2016 it was part that i think his son died and part that obama was kind of like i'm not sure it should be you you know oh, like he, he almost had picked joe biden as his vice president knowing that biden would be too old to run for president afterwards which you know funny and that then he ran for here, president and won here do you, we are do you think that the dems because you talked a bit about the anti-establishment, which because I know you talk a fair bit about how there's like it seems like there's two poles that are going on right now, which is left and right, but also like pro-establishment, anti-establishment. Do you think that if Biden ran a slightly more anti-establishment campaign, he would poll better with Biden Democrats? has been in the Senate for I don't know if it's 450 so or 460 years now. <laughs> yeah, there's no way that Biden ever runs as an anti-establishment again, and he shouldn't because they're, people they're old stupid. Sumerian clay tablets. Yeah. You know, they're yeah. saying like Joe Depicting Biden him, selling yeah. me copper is <laughs> yeah, true. yeah, his first paychecks um, for yeah. But um, no, I, I I mean I think it matters what you mean by like go anti-establishment in the same way like. When you say, are you going to be moderate, does that mean like, oh, the Marco Rubio trying to do a, a deal on immigration? Or does it mean Donald Trump moderating on Social Security? Because those were two different directions. The Republican Party could have moderated. And part, part of the party wanted to moderate on social issues and immigration. And Donald Trump swept in and said, no, nah, we're going super hard on that, but I'll moderate on this. So part, partially it's like, how do you do it? Yeah. And I think you see the Biden administration trying to do some of this in terms of like, they're trying to do some populist gesturing at like we're attacking junk fees and people actually really like that when you tell them that like it it's one of these like small issues but it polls super well so yeah because it's actually nice i think was it, it was either yeah. biden or obama that got rid of all the random airline fees right um i that's just like dumb yeah, service. For it, it's, I think it was Biden. Are, yeah. I have you ever ordered anything on DoorDash before? Yeah, it's, uh, no, I don't anymore. There's like because 10 it's like, different fucking yeah. random it's fucking or, or it's $10, like I just, um, yeah. the, just to plug PPI, who is uh, our think tank partner of the Center for New Liberalism. I just recorded a podcast uh, the other day that it just came out like two days ago uh, with Diana Moss, who is our president, vice president of competition policy, which means she does, deals with antitrust. And we talked about Ticketmaster mm -hmm. because Ticketmaster is a horrible monopoly that can charge astronomical fees With because they have service, zero yeah. like they have almost no competition and more than having no competition in ticketing they also own live nation so they have like a monopoly on the actual like running of the venues as well and like the whole thing is like fuck and so ticketmaster you know is like as clear a case of a monopoly as you can get and again cracking down on something like that is super popular I'll give you the, you want the scolding hot take? Yeah. Do it. I don't think there's that much wrong with those sites. I think that, I think that people get really mad about ticket scalping, but the reality is. Oh, so this is different. I'll, I, I'm talking about the primary market. Like uh -huh. you're, you're saying secondary markets, which is more seat geek, vivid seats, kind of a, th that kind of thing, uh, stub hub. Mm -hmm. And those, yeah, people get mad about like scalping, but I'm talking about just straight about when ticket when you're when you're charged from directly you're the first one to buy the ticket mm -hmm. and it costs five hundred dollars like a hundred of that might be going to Ticketmaster it's some crazy number oh they take they take a huge they, they, oh, okay I was gonna they have a lot of people seem to get yeah. mad because they think the ticket prices are too high but I think yeah. the issue is one of it's market stuff to where those tickets are always going to cost a lot and people get mad and they blame these companies like it, it should be 30 bucks to get a ticket to this concert and it's like bro there's only so many seats like those are yeah. always going to be really look, expensive but they might maybe they do take look taylor swift is really popular and you can't change that and there's only so Ooh, many careful. seats in there that might be the hottest thing a lot of people that, <laughs> i don't know anything about taylor swift except the only things i know about taylor swift is right now i think for a while conservatives, conservatives thought that she was a secret nazi because yeah. i remember reading a whole bunch of theories about how <laughs> she, was, she well she posted on 4chan that was proven apparently about all these nazi things even though i don't think it ever was and apparently she's either destroying football right now or a lot of people are convinced that she's destroying football because i think she's dating a footballer so you get biden elected actually and then yes. yeah and then also she's just sorry <laughs> i have to get biden elected i love and, that story so much and and also the fact that he ended up winning the super bowl her boyfriend won the super bowl and like was a, a key player in the super bowl yeah yep. people get really Travis mad Kelsey. about that yeah. Do you guys want to know a really like funny fact about the taylor swift stuff so her entire career has always been filled with tons of weird conspiracies about her because she always puts like little riddles and puzzles and games in all of her music and like uh stuff and so because of that people are constantly looking for like any little thing that she does to possibly be a cue about one thing or another she vague posts a lot about her relationships it's like Tayanon. so there's there's tons <laughs> of like bracket fandom groups that are convinced that yeah. she's like she's actually homosexual she's oh, yeah. just been hiding it oh like, no no you, you know what's even more than yeah. the gaylers 
Um, this is something I discovered. I, there, I just learned that word. There, there are so more than the Gaylors, there are Valors who are consi- they, that she's they believe non-binary? that she's non-binary. She just doesn't. This, come these out people yet. are insane. They, they're min- it's a mentally ill thing to believe, but no, I, I think it's um my position on Taylor Swift, such that I even have one, is that. I think she dated a bunch of really like artsy, musicy guys who are like deep in their feelings, like British emo types. Like she dated, I don't know, Harry Styles and John Mayer. Early on, and, she dated Joe who, from the Jonas the guy, Brothers. I think. Who's the guy from uh, the most recent one? The, the I don't bad know Taylor boy. Swift that well. I'm I don't so know. She, sorry. she dated um, some guy, some other band guy. And I've, Jake Gyllenhaal, I think she dated. But, but yeah, artistic guy, yeah, like yeah. act. I think I'm like she just needs to date a meathead, like just a lovable goofball meatheaded like football Kelsey. player. Yeah. and I think that's great. You know, good for her. Who, I, who are the most powerful stands online? Is it the Swifties? Is it the K popper? The, the K stands? You're the, a Carly Rae Jepsen stand. Right? I am a massive Carly Rae Jepsen stand. I is that your shirt? This is yes. I'm yes. The shirt. If you want to put it on camera, this is the Queen. This is Carly Rae Jepsen. She right had the here. Call Me Didn't Maybe song. Did she have song, like right? two yes. songs max? Did she make How any more? How dare you? <laughs> How dare you? I, this is where I walk out of the You're welcome to. emotion. The album the emotion Canadian is the greatest that got picked pure up by pop. Bieber. The greatest pure pop album of the last 25 years, maybe. Emotion is no skips, banger after banger. Like, How come legitimately. They trend? Because the world is cruel and the best music doesn't always hit number one. The Dreamcast of her generation. Yes, <laughs> truly. <laughs> no, truly. I could yeah, I could rant about Carly Rae Jepsen extensively I, I don't know if that's where we want to go but <laughs> interesting um okay so run away with me is a perfect song that's all i'm saying uh, I'm... taylor swift carly ray jepson and mr beast yes. what you fill all of your free time with <laughs> i do write a newsletter about online culture so you know i i get caught up in a lot of like stupid nonsense have you ever spoken to um i hate that i forgot his name right now i edited this out in the youtube video um, he, uh, I've spoken to him multiple times. He's the guy that's been writing all the articles. He got big for doing, uh, the investigatory work on, tra- uh, Jesse single. Um, I have to, I, I've had Jesse on our podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a few years back. Um, but yeah, back when, uh, I, I think we did an episode on cancel culture and he's like a guy to talk to about that or something. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, something, uh, um, do you have a question about Jesse yeah. or? No, it was just, just a random thing. Awesome? Yeah. Have you ever seen the movie Dune one or two? <laughs> it was just a random quiz time. Well, if you um, had stronger things wait, about Jesse, I would have built. You know, it's funny. Up. No, it's funny you say that because because um, you hated Dune too. No, no right? Dune two is gonna. I've heard it because so the, good. the neoliberals have decided that Dune is neoliberal. Okay. I don't okay. know why they decided this. It's is this like Christians deciding that like any type of fantasy that they personally like is Christian? The neoliberal subreddit has like actual like macros where if you like say the word Dune, it will give you an auto response that's like. Dune is neoliberal or something like that. Like, okay. or like, I, like, I don't know. They all meme about Dune all the time. And I can't, I still don't actually know why it is that okay. like, they've all just the decided greatest it. Sci-fi books that began. It was the progenitor of a whole bunch of other books. The brilliant movie. <laughs> yeah, part two of it okay. is so good. Um, are we shooting for around two hours or what are we? Yeah, we're shooting for, can we even wrap that up? Okay. Then I, well, hold on. I have one final big question. Okay. Um, I can't call myself a centrist because it's fucking cringe online today. <laughs> because when you say you're a centrist, what you actually mean is you are throating Donald Trump 24-7, but you just don't want to tell people that. How do you feel or what do you do whenever you say center anything? I got, yeah. I got, cause my political orientation is probably like center left to progressive, depending on what you're talking about. But center anything is such a horribly negative connotation with secret conservative or anti-establishment populist, yeah. whatever. Yeah. How do you feel about trying to save that term or do you identify because you said yourself like i don't yeah. want to call myself moderate yeah so i i don't like i don't love calling myself a centrist i don't love calling myself a moderate um i sometimes i do those things because you know it's it's an easy shorthand that people will understand if i say like well i'm a democrat but i'm a centrist like they'll understand what i mean most of the time like they or i'm a moderate but I don't love it because it implies, you know, a moderate or a centrist that you are triangulating your beliefs from someone else. And frankly, there are a lot of people who describe themselves as moderates or centrists, you know, even elected officials where their version of this is, well, just I think Bernie Sanders goes too far. So I believe like 40 percent of what Bernie Sanders wants. Mm -hmm. And that would be a nice level. Just anything he says, just take it down to about 40 percent. And that's where I am. And I think it's such people can immediately smell that that it's wishy washy and it's kind of fake and like it's it's insincere, and I don't like that because what I am is not a, a washed down version of Bernie Sanders. 
we have, you know, the Center for New Liberalism has a distinct ideology that I think is different from Bernie Sanders. We believe in an actual set of liberal values that are different from his socialist values. And look, if, if you want to be a socialist, I'll, I'll say that you're wrong and your values should change, but like, it, at least it's an ethos, right? Like it's a, it's a defined political philosophy. And I don't like saying that I am, oh, just a kind of centrist from that. I believe in, you know, the, the liberal institutions that we have, the strength of institutions are important and you shouldn't screw with them. I believe in freedoms of speech and religion and, uh, you know, assembly and the classic kind of bill of rights, liberal values. I believe that we should all be treated equally and have the strong rule of law. And like, I believe in democratic values. I believe in globalist values. And that's a word that I actually love to use because it's still controversial. I believe For that, sure. you know, a more globalist world would be a good world with more immigration and more trade and more international institutions centrist that connect and us all. And this is like, I'm not centrist in terms of like, I, be I want way more housing built. That is not a, you know, just centrist wishy-washy position. I want lots more immigration. I want free trade. I want a lot of things that are not just in the middle. So I call myself center left, but like, it's not the perfect thing. I, I like to call myself a liberal, most of all. I feel like centrist and moderate are just a virtue signal for people trying to say, I'm not biased. And that's what it ends up becoming a, a, an attempted proxy for, where someone's yeah. like, oh, I'm a moderate, I'm a centrist. Like, I'm not a shill for either party, even though they'll hardline carry yeah. like, a particular set of beliefs. I, that I are, think it, it depends you know. whether you're, you know, your perspective, I think, is a little bit more online discourse Oof. oriented, where mine is potentially a little bit more influenced in, by DC, where in, in DC, just people will call themselves center left or moderate. And that's just, it's just what they call themselves. And like, right. you know, it just kind of the, what, what the water you're swimming in, sure. I guess. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, but I agree with your overall point. I don't love that term. And I prefer to say I'm a new liberal, which is a kind of liberal that has liberal values. And this is our flavor of liberalism and liberal is a political philosophy that goes back several hundred years. And I can be pointing you to John Stuart Mill or John Locke. And like, there's a real intellectual weight to what we're saying. And that's what I believe, not, oh, I'm a cinch. I just take the average of Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump and we'll probably end up in the right place. Like that's crap, right? I'm so curious. Do you then, cause like when I look at the left, I hear a lot of like left people saying that they're politically homeless. And I feel like they often end up becoming like th this moderate that is mostly like veiled conservatism. Do you feel like there's a, like a growing rumble for a like true new left movement? Cause right now it seems like, especially in the discourse, left when you think of left when i tell people i i'm left right i'm progressive they think um trying to agitate towards socialism um and probably in part because i'm also on the internet more so than anything do you see though that there's kind of a movement of like a new left in the democrats in policy in general that's a little bit more embodying of like the john locks and like kind of that more traditional liberalism that's not i'm a classical liberal meme i mean it's i probably wouldn't use the words you're saying although i kind of understand what you're getting at like to me the left like capital l left is a different thing than what most democrats are like the left is would traditionally be someone who is would identify as a socialist or an anarchist right. and so that that's not most democrats the the capital l left would be like we need socialism we need you know capitalism should go and so I, I, it's not my place. I'm not on the left in that sense. Mm. Uh, I'm on the, you know, the broad left of American politics, but that's different from kind of the capital L left. Ironically, in op opposite to your last statement, I feel like that's a statement that is only rings true really online and with very young people. Because like if I were to talk to my parents who are older conservatives, yeah. people like Biden or liberals would be described as like, oh, far left. Like these are the left, the leftists. Mm -hmm. yeah. But online or with really young people, leftist basically exclusively refers to illiberal, socialist, communist, like those types of people, which is like another interesting yeah. thing online, yeah. And I mean, so uh, uh, I like to draw that distinction between the between liberals and the left because we are trying to make that distinction clear that we think the Democratic Party should have this set of values instead of that other one. Um, so I, I tend to try to keep that distinction clear. I do think you're right. Like if you just talk to, you know, the random guy outside grilling who doesn't pay attention to politics, but once every four years, he's like, oh yeah, Democrats are the left. And you know, that's how he understands it. And that's fine. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, we should all be more like the grill guy. Um, there, there was a meme a while back of like, you know, Democrats, Republicans, I just want to grill. And I genuinely think the country would be better off if we, if all of us were a little bit more like that guy. Okay. Interesting. Like less politically involved. Yes. I think that 
less obsessive about politics, okay. less willing to fight each other online in that sort of way. Like it, it's the thing that we were talking about where I think political engagement is good, but not the kind of political engagement that is just starting fights on Twitter or whatever. Like that kind of engagement sucks and you're just poisoning your brain. You're accomplishing nothing except making America hate each other marginally more. Like what, what have you done? What have you contributed to the world with this, you know, insane shit that you post on Twitter. I don't know. Uh, th those people should grill a little bit more. Hmm. Well said. I agree. Where can people find you if they're looking for your stuff? Website, podcast? Uh... So my uh, on Twitter, I'm at Jeremiah D. Johns, and I write uh, Infinite Scroll, which is a sub stack. You can find that infinite scroll .us. Um If you're looking for the Center for New Liberalism, you can find us at CN Liberalism on Twitter. You can go to cnliberalism.org slash become a member and see if there's a local chapter in your city, if you're interested. Um, you can join as a paid member. You can join as a free member. Um, you can join a local chapter. Um, you can go to the r slash neoliberal subreddit. Uh, I think that's most of our major communities, but yeah. Awesome. Okay. Do you have any housekeeping that you want to say before we close up? No. Nope. Okay. Cool. Um, some housekeeping for you guys. Uh, obviously, you guys are going to have uh, big feelings about uh, the first episode or maybe not feelings at all. Uh, so feel free to post your thoughts in the subreddit. I will be watching and reading. Um, but if you're super mean, I'm not going to read it because I don't care. <laughs> not I don't know. I, I feel like I've been um, I've always been like just you can't call yourself a neoliberal on the Internet and care that people are mean to you. Because I like at some point I just learned to stop caring. Have you guys gotten that as well? You guys have been online for a long time. I'm expecting them to be mean about the podcast itself, not so much you. But maybe they'll be really salty about you. I doubt it though. It wouldn't be the first time. Yeah. We'll yeah. Survive. Thanks a lot for coming on. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, I really appreciate you. Um, we'll be back in March 23rd with Ryan Macbeth. So make sure you guys check that out.